I'd like to welcome you to the Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022, regular meeting of the Palm Springs Planning Commission. Can I have a staff report, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Can I have a call or a roll call? Commissioner Lane. Here. Commissioner uh, Irvin is excused. Commissioner Hirschbein. Present. Commissioner Miller. Here. Commissioner Maruzzi is excused as well. Vice Chair Roberts. Present. Chair Wormick. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Can we have a report on the posting of the agenda, please? Madam Chair and Planning Commissioners, our agenda was published on Thursday, February 17th. Our meeting has been posted in accordance with state law. Thank you. Uh, can I have a motion <clears throat> on the acceptance of the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That passes unanimously. The next item is public comments. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on consent calendar and other agenda items and items in the general uh, subject matter interest of the commission. Please note that the Planning Commission cannot take action on items not listed on the posted agenda. Each speaker will have three minutes. Testimony for public hearings may be offered at this time or at the time of the hearing. Members of the public who would like to comment on items 1A and 1B, the consent calendar, or 3A and 3B are directed to comment under this portion of the agenda. The only exception is the applicant on items 3A and 3B will have five minutes at the time of that item to comment on both of them. Uh, can you open the public hearing, please? Yes, Madam Chair. So any member of the public who wishes to address the commission, please um, unmute your microphone and click the raise hand feature under the reactions button at the bottom of the screen. Alternatively, if you don't see that option, feel free to send a note to me in the chat that you would like to speak. So it looks like our first speaker is Beverly Palmer. there. Um, sorry, I thought my camera was on out there. Um, hello, and uh, thank you. I'm here to comment on items 3A and 3B on behalf of the Mesa Neighborhood Organization. Uh, I transmitted a letter uh, late in the day yesterday. I hope you've had an opportunity to review it. Uh, specifically, we are concerned with the reliance on a CEQA exemption for the construction of the two homes in uh, on on Crestview. Uh, first, there are the project is really more than two homes. The applicant has admitted in public hearings before the ARC that the applicant intends to construct on the remainder of these lots. And under the uh, CEQA case law that I discussed in my letter, the full scope of the project must be evaluated. And that is true also when evaluating the propriety of a CEQA exemption. Uh, second. There are unusual circumstances here that make the construction of these two to five homes different than a typical single family home, which make reliance on an exemption improper. And specifically, we are concerned about the proximity of these homes to the habitat for uh, bighorn sheep. They're frequently seen in this area. My letter included photos and uh, video clips. And these animals are easily disturbed by noise and construction. and uh, exposure to such human activity has been documented to cause adverse impacts, particularly to pregnant and nursing ewes and their, their lambs. Um, and so we would urge that environmental review is especially important for that reason. But additionally, these properties are located adjacent to or in the floodplain. And the floodplain issue is interesting because the study of the flood, the flood zone stopped right at right on these properties. It hasn't been extended as far back up as the 310 property. The um, It appears from my review of these plans that the rear portion of the home, the special flood hazard area, so special uh, city permits are required for such construction. 
And since the flood analysis has not been conducted yet, it is unclear where exactly the special flood hazard area would be for the other properties. But it would seem likely that some of that portion of the 310 lot would fall within the flood hazard area as well. And this flooding is a major concern. I included some photos of the flooding on El Camino Way. Uh, it's not something that should be ignored, and the city should not approve the projects at the very least before the hydrology analysis is completed and it is known whether there are issues with any of them. And therefore, um, this is really the case that is ripe for further analysis and review, both under CEQA and just under the city's normal planning rules. Um, it's not really a typical building a home on a subdivision that was already approved. Uh, so thank you very much. I'd urge you to, to reject the proposal and make the applicant do a little more work to show that this is not going to have adverse environmental effects. Ms. Palmer, uh, Eric, please identify yourself for the record, your full name, and you'll have three minutes. Yeah, hi, my name is Eric Hawkins, um, the applicant for projects 3A, 3B. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to later speak um, in regards to the, the minor revisions that were made um, that we'll be presenting later. But um, I was asked to respond to Miss Amanda Ross. Um, so I'd like to do that now. Um, Just one second, please. Uh, I had, David, can you help with this? You had asked me to have him speak in the, uh, at the time of the hearing on the items but he wasn't going to be speaking at this point in time. I'm a yeah, bit concerned that the that he's speaking in two time at two different times on unfinished business where uh, we're extending a special courtesy. Yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Hawkins, I think we'll reserve the time for when the items are heard, and uh, hopefully we can address those items then. Thank you. Joseph Burke, you have three minutes. Thank you. Joseph Burke, 333 West Crestview, resident of the Mesa since 2013. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for this meeting tonight. Uh, wow, Ms. Palmer sort of addressed some of the things I wanted to talk about. So I would just like to say, when these plans were first submitted, uh, I was shocked by the size the density, the mass of the houses. The story poles are up. And even though the plans have been revised and made a tiny bit smaller, it's still, they overwhelm the space. They don't respect the topography of the lot. And if you, especially if you look at the photographs on the renderings, that third photograph, I mean, the, the developer hasn't taken time to really show what the two houses are going to look like. It, it blurs together. It looks like one huge block. And uh, I feel that, you know, he's, we, they have not made enough effort to fit in with the neighborhood, to get feedback from us, and to come up with something harmonious that we can all be proud of, or at least uh, live with. Um, and I'm, I'm glad we have this opportunity because I, I've felt that. I feel like a little, little bit like David and Goliath. You know, when I first saw those plans, I talked to a lot of neighbors around here. I even got, got a petition up asking for, you know, a review of the of these before they were approved. And when I was turning in the pet petition to the to the city planning department, I was told, hey, these are these houses are going to get built. Um, that doesn't give me a lot of faith in the process. I'm hoping that you guys are going to really pay attention to all applicable applicable regulations uh, and follow them and insist that the developer follow them before going through with something that will you know, be here for a long time. And so I thank you. Uh, thank you for, for your time and your consideration tonight. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Anyone else who wishes to speak, please uh, click the raise hand feature or raise your hand, Mr. Malone. If you'd like to speak now, I understand uh, via the email you sent me earlier that you wanted to speak on the public hearing item. You can either speak now or wait until that item is heard. So, um, um, 
I'll, I'll be real quick and uh, and uh, get my two cents in. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, long story short, uh, this is in regards to the uh, uh, development uh, uh, in the Sumner neighborhood uh, uh, on uh, next to Alejo. Our concerns are that, at, uh, long story short, I'm John D. Malone, uh, live at 490 North Farrell. Uh, that's just on the corner of Alejo and Farrell. Uh, the house has been uh, in my wife's family since the early 1960s. Um, one of the things that we would like to bring to the attention of the Planning Commission is there is an enormous amount of truck traffic on Alejo going through this residential section. Uh, these uh, trucks uh, uh, amount to many times very large uh, automobile carriers uh, coming from the rental district. Uh, we also see uh, uh, dual gasoline trucks rolling through there from the rental district. And in all honesty, there's probably at least 50, 60 uh, UPS trucks uh, that roll out of the UPS area uh, running uh, to Alejo, making a right or left on Farrell Drive. Um, I would uh, uh, bring up the point that uh, Alejo uh, is not a truck route, uh, but uh, certainly will now be uh, on both, have residential areas on both sides of it uh, with the development comes. I'd like to offer that uh, I have a feeling a lot of the truck traffic could work its way uh, on North Civic Drive. Um, there may also be some opportunities uh, you know, way, you know, down the road, uh, you know, for uh, potential expansion um, on North Commercial, uh, the more North Commercial Road uh, to North Farrell uh, that would take this uh, out of uh, residential neighborhoods overall. So uh, thank you very much, Planning Commission. Uh, uh, whatever you can do to uh, minimize uh, this uh, very heavy truck traffic on Alejo would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Mr. Malone. Uh, our next speaker is Jim. And uh, Jim, if you could just state your full name for the record, please. Hi, uh, Jim Dunn, and I live on Ridge Road, and I'm speaking on items 3A and 3B. Um, <clears throat> to reiterate some of the things we've said before, um, first of all, uh, we were very um, happy to see the story poles go up so that we could actually see the massing of this project. Um, if you look at it, hopefully you've all had the opportunity to go out there and visit the site since that happened. Um, if you look at it from the canyon side on either El Camino or Ridge Road, uh, it's it's very telling and, and kind of illustrates what our concern has been uh, since the beginning. Uh, the mass and scale of this project um, is quite a bit larger than the surrounding homes on similar sized lots. Um, and <clears throat> by building two houses, right now and potentially up to four or five houses of a similar design um, is what is taking away from the neighborhood, we believe. Um, I think if there's one house that's different, then that fits. It, it doesn't have to match a design that's already here. Um, but the problem is when we start building one, two, three, four houses that all look very similar, um, to each other, but not necessarily to the neighborhood. That's when you create kind of a dynamic change to the neighborhood, in our opinion. Um, so for our, at, at this point, we just don't feel like it fits the neighborhood, the design. I think there have been improvements made since the beginning. Um, but I think what we're looking for is to see more variation in that. Um, and then I think the, the other things that we've said kind of all along is to make sure that we have everything ready to go, um, including hydrology and all of the reports um, uh, done before um, we start to move forward with the approval on the projects. So um, those are my my comments. Um, and obviously, I support the, the comments made before by my neighbors and, and the attorney. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Um... Anyone else wishing to speak at this time, please unmute your microphone. Mr. Crutt, I see your camera is on. Do you wish to speak? Anyone else wishing to speak? Now is the last opportunity. Please unmute your microphone.
appears that that is all of the public comments, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Newell. Uh, with that, the public hearing is closed. Uh, we're moving to the consent calendar. There are two items on the consent calendar. 1A is the approval of the minutes of February 9th, 2022. And the 1B is the Sanborn architecture on behalf of one lost Balmas for a parcel map waiver to subdivide an existing one lot parcel into three separate parcels within the gated one loss Palmas subdivision located at 555 North Monte Vista. Um, can I have a motion please? I move approval as presented. Is there a second? Uh, Mr. Miller has seconded. Uh, can I have a roll call please? Vice Chair Roberts? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Elaine? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. And Chair Wormack? Yes. Thank you. The next item is um, item two. It's a public hearing. Item uh, Beatitude LLC for a conditional use permit to operate a cannabis manufacturing facility within an existing building at 771 South Palm Springs or South Williams Road, Suite 777. Uh, staff report, please. And uh, staff report, please. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. My applicant is proposing a 928 square foot cannabis manufacturing and distribution facility uh, located within an existing industrial park off South Williams Road. Um, there are four other cannabis facilities in the immediate vicinity. To the north, we have Capital Growth, um, which is a dispensary cultivation and manufacturing facility. To the west, we have Desert Care, um, which is a dispensary manufacturing and distribution facility as well. And then to the south, we have um, SPS Manufacturing LLC, which is a dispensary lounge manufacturing cultivation and distribution facility. There are There is another uh, cannabis facility within this business park. It's uh, called Baked Betty's. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, my applicant is not proposing a lounge, so there is no separation distance requirement, um, and it is in compliance with the M1 uh, zoning code. Here's just a, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, here's just a photo of what the site plan looks like. Um, the applicant is in compliance with parking. There's sufficient parking for um, the cannabis facility and um, it is in compliance with the permitted uses, uh, conditionally permit, permitted uses of the M1 zone. Here's a quick look of uh, what the tenant space looks like inside. It's uh, fairly small. It's gonna consist of a storage room, restroom, an office, and a little reception area. But other than that, it, it pretty basic um, tenant space. Uh, as far as sensitive uses go, my uh, applicant is not within um, a sensitive use area. It, Demuth Park would be the closest sensitive use to the proposed project site, and Demuth Park is actually over a thousand feet away, so they aren't located within any sensitive uses. Um, I did want to bring to your attention that the um, Cannabis facility is proposed to operate Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. They are anticipating one to two employees. Um, and the odor control plan has been reviewed by their Department of Special uh, Program Compliance and our odor consultant, who is available to answer any questions um, pertaining to the odor control plan. Um, staff does recommend approval subject to conditions, and that concludes my report. 
Are there questions about Are there questions about Mr. Hirschman? Did, did you say me? I couldn't understand. Yes, Mr. Hirschman. Thank you. Was this uh, application made prior to the change in zone that doesn't allow an end use in this area? Ooh. I believe so. I'm not too sure, actually. Um, Madam Chair, just so I can add on, uh, yes, this this um, application is in compliance with current standards because it's not the heavier manufacturing type of a facility. Uh, it's the type in infusion, which doesn't use uh, chemicals that is a permissible use currently in the M1 zone. Okay, so could you just describe that? Yes, so um, when we did the update to the cannabis regulations um, a couple of years ago, the city uh, changed specifically um, where the heavier manufacturing cannabis uses could be located. Uh, so the uh, type N and type P uses uh, that we uh, that are considered less likely to produce odors or less of an odor based on the processes that they're um, using. Um, those uses were, were permitted within the M1 zone um, through a conditional use permit. And so the heavier um, manufacturing uses um, that are licensed with the state um, as a different type that are not type N or type P, those licenses are only permitted in the cannabis overlay zone, which is most of the freeway. Okay. And then, uh, you know, when we've looked at uh, these kind of projects in the past, we've specified um, a box in a box or building in a building. Had, has that been discussed with the applicant? No, I've not discussed that with an app the applicant. Okay, and then uh, you mentioned the uses of the space. You said office and restroom and so forth. You said storeroom, but you didn't mention manufacturing area. So was that left oh, out on, um, on purpose or you just didn't mention that? No, I apologize. I just didn't mention it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Are there other questions of staff? If not, I have two. One is the, the fact that the uh, industrial area is in really bad shape. And one of the reasons we've allowed cannabis in these areas is to clean it up. And the facility, um, it looks like it needs paint, the wood needs help. Uh, it's in, it, just, it just doesn't look good. Is there anything that we can do regarding that? Um, I suppose we could put some conditions that, I'm sorry, David. Uh, I was just going to say the applicant hasn't proposed any changes, but the commission could request if they are willing to make modifications to the exterior. Um, ultimately, that would have to be approved by the owner, um, depending on the extent of the changes. But um, it would be something that the applicant would have to work out with the property owner. And then the second question is in previous uh, applications like this, we have put stronger language in PLN which required that if the applicant didn't file the reports that were required, they would need to file. Um, and it um, this merely says that it should be grounds for revocation. So, can you suggest? Can you, if we get to approval, can you give us stronger language? Um, I believe in the past we have had conditions that were more specific relative to address or um, 
requiring compliance with Chapter 5 relative to whatever fines or um, citations that the city might impose, but in terms of um, prohibiting further operation, uh, I, 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 we might have the city attorney address that, but I think um, we have to still do the due process investigation that would be necessary to make sure a, a, um, a complaint is credible before the operation could be um, required to cease operation. So um, I think we can strengthen the language to say citations, fines, as and other means the city requires once the um, once the city deems a complaint credible. Um, I think that's that's more appropriate, but um, beyond that, I think we might run into due process issues. The, the reason I'm concerned is we want another facility operating for three, I think three to four years with serious odor complaints on the average of once a week without any city action. So I would like to see stronger language in these, the strongest language we can put in these. Um, with that, um, we can open the public hearing. I'm seeing that there are no more comments. Um, and that, Madam Chair, if I might add um, one thing. Yes, please. The um, city's odor consultant could also um, provide additional um, details on the type of manufacturing that is proposed, if the commission would like. They are available for questions. Um, and from our understanding or our if knowledge. They're, if they're sorry? available, you can bring them in. Um, do people have questions of the odor control consultant in this case? I have one, uh, which is next to this facility is probably the nicest uh, dog daycare facility in the city. Will dogs smell odors that we don't coming from this facility? Will it harm them? I they have good. They have good sense of smell, so I I I can't speak to dogs' sense of smell. Will there any be any odors emanating from this facility? Uh, the the target is always objectionable odors is to match the regulations, and this is well within compliance. They're actually doing an ionization on top of the activated carbon uh, carbon filtration, and as as the planning commission moves forward and uh, populates the um, the uh, requirements of this, I would I would encourage you to just uh, I would encourage you to populate the requirements be followed through to building as this is an entitlement process. The conditions of approval are usually theoretical in nature, much like the compliance to the odor control plan uh, is dictated that they will. But we still need to maintain that there be some sort of inspections throughout to make sure that the, it is installed correctly. Do we have this normal? Um conditions in this regarding inspections? That's been put in there previously on- It's on not a, here. I, I, in to some days. extent, yeah, it's not here. And I'm, I'm concerned that we're getting a package that hasn't been thought through. Um, what I would like to do, I don't know if anybody else would agree with me, is send this back to staff, bring it back next time, have staff work on the conditions so that we have the the normal inspection conditions and strengthened uh, strengthened conditions for ignoring uh, citations. Commissioner Hirschbein. If we do that, I'd like to add the condition about box and box or building and building. So uh, I'm gonna make, at this point, I think we have an insufficient package. Madam Chair, I would ask that we open the hearing before we choose to continue this to allow testimony for those who have uh, come to the meeting this evening? That's fine. So the applicant would be the first um, person to speak. Is the applicant here? He is here. They're here. Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> I apologize. I was trying to get 
get everything up and running. Hello, Arbo Reiki on behalf of Beatitude LLC. Um, Is there a particular question I had to respond to? You have you have five, 10 minutes to present your project. Gotcha, okay. So, um, well, as mentioned, it is a 928 square foot manufacturing and distribution project on Williams Road. And to further clarify, it is type N. It's strictly infusion, meaning we receive existing concentrates from other suppliers and infuse it on the premises. And that's really gonna be limited to only that. <clears throat> and the odor control as discussed with our, the, the consultant on the uh, application, we went through significant revisions and to ensure that there really was going to be little to no odor emanating from the, from the uh, structure. And given the process, as well as the similarities that we with our neighbor baked Betty's, um, we tried to pretty much replicate their process. In fact, try to enhance it if possible with the ionization and the carbon filter. So as far as odor is controlled, we do not foresee any significant odor uh, as far as the human sense, as far as uh, when it comes to animals, I'm sure animals like dogs would be able to possibly sense it. Again, I don't know from experience, but as far as it is harmful, I cannot tell you statistically, <laughs> um, I'll say blessing. <laughs> but I will say that uh, it is it, it shouldn't be harmful by any means, like, especially because there is no actual extraction happening on the premises given the license type. And uh, we don't project a large operation, especially uh, within the first year. It's projected to be very limited in the sense that it's gonna be small batches with a small handful of, uh, of licensees we'll be working with. So the actual infusion processes will not occur more than, I wanna say a couple of times a month. It's mostly gonna be used initially just for, for storage and distribution, which uh, again is not going to, uh, which does not really relate to flower, obviously not cultivation or flower on the premises. So there really should not be any significant odor at all. Um, but um, I'm not sure how to further elaborate for the time being, but I guess I will, I'll stop there for now. Are, are there any members of the public that wish to speak? Uh, Madam Chair, no direct request to staff or members of the public, but if anyone if is on the questions, call. Uh, if the applicant's here, and um, since you don't have rebuttal, possibly people who have questions can ask you questions. Uh, Commissioner Roberts, Vice Chair Roberts, you have your, had your hand up for a long time. Uh, not that long. Um, and it's funny, when you have your virtual hand up, it doesn't get tired. Um, so... I have a question um, uh, for Mr. Is it Bikai? Is that how you pronounce it? Bikai. Okay. And then a question for you, uh, Chair. So, Mr. Bikai, you do infusion into what? Into edibles or to what? It's, it's mostly going into <clears throat> vaporizer pens, disposable pens or cartridges for the most part. There may, there may be very little infusion in edibles to start. And if anything, it's really going to be um, either the, the basics like chocolate or some form of gummy, but that's not really going to be a heavy focus, at least not in our plans. It is mostly going to be, when I say mostly, I mean probably over 90% is really going to be strictly going into pens and cartridges. So you are simply getting the concentrated liquids and so forth for infusion into other things. Does that emit any odor? To be honest, I mean, from, from my personal experience doing it, the only odor that I or my team would be able to detect is if you're really in very close proximity to a liter of concentrate and you take a big whiff. Otherwise, if you were to even walk in a room, you, you can't tell. 
Um, that was my next question. If I were to walk into any room in your facility and not put my head, you know, right up against the product, would I notice it in the room? Most likely not, only because, like I said, for one, it's also very small batches we're doing. But two, even if we weren't, uh, it's it's really just taking the existing concentrate, literally opening up a container, pouring it into uh, whatever a machine we're using, whatever device we're using, and then it's enclosed in its own container within the device, and then it just literally just injects it into a pen and it seals it up. So the opportunity to actually allow any kind of odor to kind of emanate anywhere is very, very low. And uh, the types of oils that we get, they're also not meant to be, uh, it's meant to be more discreet and not really be as uh, as odorous as most people will, will assume cannabis would be. No, I thank you. I know and I understand different levels of processing uh, create different levels of odor. So to you, Chair, and to Mr. Newell, why are we sending this back? What I'm a little unclear on what we don't have for this. My concern is that we've dealt with several of these over time. And in each instance, we've gotten conditions regarding inspections. Uh, and, it's, and I think inspections at three months, at a, at a, a year, at the applicant's expense, I've, I'm concerned that the staff work on this is not as good as it should be uh, in terms of making sure that the conditions match what the uh, commission has been asking for in the past. So why, wouldn't we, why, wouldn't, why would we not simply add a condition for inspection? If Mr. Newell can give us conditions, the standard conditions for inspection and we include them in our motion, I'm very happy with that. I would also like to see a rewritten condition for PLN3. Mr. Newell, is Veronica with us today? Yes. Yes, and I have the, the condition relative to inspections from a previous application in front of me. So I can read that into the record if the commission would like. Um, is, is Veronica, do you have your ears on? David, do you, do you think you, oh, hi, Veronica. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. It's awfully bright there in front of City Hall. <laughs> so, Veronica, did have you been hearing our discussion here? I, I have, yes. Do, is there anything that you can add here? I, I mean, I'd rather not send an applicant packing uh, to come back and uh, if you have the typical conditions that we add, um, to move this forward, it, it's. I, I agree. I think it it is sufficient to move forward with some additional provisions. I do think Jay can uh, speak a little more on the odor type and infusion has very little odor associated with it, and especially if you're infusing chocolates or baked goods or gummies. You smell the baking, uh, not the cannabis. The odor is so minute. Um, I think that Jay could attest like what um, milestones would need to be have inspections at, but I don't think it's um, worth sending it back. Veronica and Jay, um, our concern as always is that if his business were to shift or he were to get into some other processing and odors were created, we may or may not know about that. We now have- The chair, the chair the I, mean, officer. I know that you have approved his odor control plan, but can you give us something now to assuage our chair's concerns about inspections um, for this facility, at least for the first year or two, to make sure that they're in full compliance and not leaking odors? We have David read the standard conditions that we've required in the past. Okay. I mean, do we need more than that, really? We need standard conditions. We, if we have an odor control plan, I completely agree with the odor control consultant that is only as good as the fact that you inspect the facility uh, to make sure that it's working when it starts up and you do some subsequent inspections. Veronica, what is our typical inspection period on new facilities like this? Um, we have had the bench for three can, months. Can David read the conditions in and then Veronica can speak? Yeah, oh, sure. 
inspections of mechanical equipment shall be required at one month, three months, six months, and then after the biannual basis, and then after on a biannual basis by an independent third party chosen by the city at the applicant's expense. Do we need more than that? No. Okay. So is there any reason to send it back? Uh, the only other one is I would like to see PLN3. Uh, my concern is something coming to us without the due diligence of having looked at what we've standardly approved. So I'm fine if we get what we what we need in this, but I would like to see it in the motions. I, I won't have to send it back if we get if we get this information. And well, can um, staff? Do you need to pull this together and we can move on to another? Um, item at the moment or do, are you ready for this? I just hate throwing work back at staff if we can move this forward. Yeah, staff is comfortable adding that condition as well as any additional language that we um, that we would like to add to strengthen the compliance um, factor for the applicant to ensure that uh, they get into compliance in the event that there are odor complaints. Um, as long you know, as long as we're within the law. Okay, I, I mean, I'm gonna for myself. I'm satisfied with that level of inspection. Um, unless my colleagues want to add more to it, I feel like we should move it forward. I just want to make sure that we everything we get that has cannabis has inspections included in it. That's another issue, though. I I don't want to make this applicant wait or go through another month and costs, if that's more of an issue of policy than this specific applicant. Sending it back, that was a peak of anger at this point at getting, I'm sorry to say that, at getting an application that was not uh, in, uh, not put together as well as it normally has been. I fully understand your concern. Let's just not punish the applicant for it. Uh, can can our attorney, I know you're a visiting attorney, give David language on PLN3 so that we can uh, we can get a motion. Are there any other questions for the applicant? I have one, which is just, you know you're renting this facility. It's in very bad shape. Have you talked to your, um, the party that owns it regarding any improvements on, on the exterior? We, we briefly mentioned exterior, it was early on in the application process. I believe it was brought up by Alex and we tried to reach out to the owner and see what we can do. We didn't get a solid answer, um, but if, if the owner is amenable to the idea of any kind of improvement, because we already are gonna be doing some uh, minor tenant improvements inside <clears throat> the, uh, the unit. So as far as the exterior, if uh, again, if the owner is amenable to it, we're more than happy to take care of it. And, and yeah, I mean, the existing, the other two existing struck um, units that are operating as cannabis, I don't believe they've had any external exterior modifications at all or improvements, but I would say if that's something we have to do, I would hope the other ones would kind of fall in, you know, follow suit. Um, I am going to take a motion to approve the public hearing at this point. Commissioner Hirschbein had a point and I'd like Jay to talk to it. I think <clears throat> the extraction process they're talking about, this may not require a box in a box. Jay, can you speak to that? Yeah, generally we were looking for the box in the box and what we're calling a separate envelope on high odorous activities. The high odorous activity for cold cultivation and generally type seven and some type six manufacturing. Infusion is a very, very low activity. And in the sense of manufacturing, it's on the lowest spectrum. Uh, distillates do range. They have a faint odor sometimes, and then they run way down to no odor. Uh, the expectation of source odors in this building is very low in comparison to a regular cannabis facility. You won't have open products for very long. You would expect the same amount of odors being generated in a dispensary that should not have open products. So I would expect low odor source generated to begin with and a compliant odor control plan that they have. 
So the question is, uh, previously uh, in permits, have we ever required it? I don't recall. The box in the box is uh, specific to maintaining pressure relationships in here that we just don't have here because we don't have the complexity of a massive high high odor source. Well, when so we first started a, doing when we first started doing it, it was because the older buildings seem to have just openings mm -hmm. and leakage. Right. I, I don't know. It had to do with pressure, but um, right. Back to the new standards are maintaining a pressure relationship that is calculated, and that we're making sure that the building is negative. Now you're not allowing the building to leak anymore. So even if the building is loose, the expectation of pressure would be outward in because we're mandating that they follow the outside air ventilation rules to gen to create our odor stream that is treated. So okay. every building cannabis facility will be negative pressure to the ambient exterior. So you're saying that in your recollection and we've not required that? Not for type N or like a dispensary, not that okay. I can recall. All right, then I'm okay with that, thank you. Mm -hmm. And just in your experience, the odor control plan is sufficient for this, for this facility? Yeah, I mean, similar to you, I have some frustrations regarding the the way it's written, but that's uh, that's like 31 different flavors. Uh, we're not asking people to go above and beyond what is mandated. They did a little bit. It sort of confuses the a little bit, but uh, we're we're content with the plan as it is. And this is to the current standards. It's not to an earlier standard. Yes, yeah, for N. Yes, correct. Good. Thank you. Okay, the matter is back before the commission. Um, I'll make a motion for approval with three, three exceptions. One is that we have the standard um, inspection period of a, a PLN condition. I assume it's going to be 14. Um, and David, you've read that into the record. So uh, the other is that the applicant make efforts with the uh, owner to be able to do some minor improvements to the exterior of the building. Um, and the third is um, that we get a writ rewritten PLN three. Uh, has our attorney been able to draft something for us? Madam Chair, I would also just note that I think um, PLN number three, 13 is the condition that was added in response to the commission's requests in the past relative to business closure as a potential result for non-compliance. So if you repeal in 13 has that as a requirement, I think maybe we could strengthen that and say um, violations in, uh, identified under chapter 5.55 of the municipal code to specifically identify which section of the code um, they're required to be in compliance with at all times. I will second that motion. And do we, does, does our attorney agree with that? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I would like you to chime in. Madam Chair, I haven't drafted any new language. What I, observed was uh, Mr. Newell reading into the record a condition about inspection and I thought I saw a consensus from the commission saying that that would be enough. No, the inspections is enough. There isn't a consensus. The motion requires some strengthening of either PLN 3 or, or PLN 15. Well, I'm not clear on how it needs to be strengthened, but we can certainly, if, if you are, just uh, we can read it into the record and we'll conform the written resolution before it's signed. I, I, Chair Werman, I, I will note that we have grounds for revocation of the permit uh, for any problems under PLM 3, PLM 14, or PLM 4 and PLM 13. I, for one, am comfortable. I'm not comfortable because we had a facility operating for four years that was completely in violation, that was not closed down. Was it an inje injection facility? No, and it an injection facility, but I would like to see that we have strong language that you can't just 
it not provide the answers in a timely fashion and have that only be grounds for revocation. I think that there has to be a, there have to be some other penalties for being out of compliance. Madam Chair, I did hear earlier your concern about uh, if complaints are received and not acted upon, um, that there that might be grounds for revocation. I have serious concerns about taking any action against a, uh, an applicant or a permittee just based on complaints. It really needs to due process requires that we investigate a complaint and we verify that there is in fact a violation. It needs to result in a fine or some under some other uh, indication or, or, or decision that there has determination that there has been a violation. If there is a violation established, then the, the, uh, the commission or other body can take appropriate action, but we can't revoke just based on complaints. I'm not going to revocation. I'm looking at PLN three and what is timely? I, is that a week? Is that a day? Uh, I, that's that's where I'm not comfortable. And again, it's because we have we have had situations that have not been attended to. May I suggest that this is an enforcement problem more than it is a condition problem? And I would suggest that this is a conversation that would take place with the city attorney and city staff about our enforcement issues. If the, the, there, there are some pretty hard rules in here for applicants now that were not in place four years ago. We all, four years ago, the specific facility that you're referring to did not have anywhere near the, the conditions or the coverage and odor control plans that we have in place today. I think that we're overlaying a past issue on a new applicant. And if the city's not enforcing on odor problems, that's not going to be solved within this particular application. That's something we need to have a separate conversation about. I don't think it's to do it here and now. Fine. We have a motion. Do we have a, we have a second? Call the roll. Chair Wemmick. Yes. Vice Chair Roberts. Yes. Commissioner Lan. Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Approved five with two absent. Uh, we're moving to the next item, which is AG Land Investments LLC for general plan amendment from current industrial uh, designation to very low density residential change of zone from planned research and development park. Uh, M1P to single family residential R1C and tentative track map and administrative minor modification to subdivide 2.53 acres of undeveloped land to create eight single family residential lots for future development at 2100 East Alejo Road. Staff report, please. Yes. And can we have this brief? Uh, I'm assuming. Uh, does anybody need a long and thorough staff report on this, or can we have a brief staff report? I'm assuming this can be very brief. Also, Chair, can we ask if there's anyone here to speak on this for or, or against it? We already did have somebody speaking um, in public comments. We do. Okay. We did earlier, we did. Mr. Mr. Malone. That that's correct. I uh, I uh, brought up the comment. Uh, thank you oh, very much. No, no, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is still before staff. Uh, do we, can we have a very short staff oh. report, please? Sure. Uh, good evening. The project in front of you tonight is, as introduced, uh, is for the subdivision of undeveloped uh, land to create eight single, family, eight single family residential parcels for future development. Uh, the, this project involves a general plan amendment, change of zone, 
alternative track map and administrative minor modification applications. Um, so the project site is a 2.53 acre vacant lot that is adjacent to um, the existing single family residential development to the west, uh, the existing business park to the north, and the professional building to the east. And there's a city yard directly uh, the south of the project site. And uh, the project site is located on Alejo Road between Juanita and the Commercial Road. And this is just to show the existing conditions of the project site. Uh, again, the site is vacant and uh, the topography is relatively flat. Uh, the applicant is proposing to subdivide this project site into eight single family residential lots. And uh, there are no uh, above ground structures proposed at this moment as a part of this project. Um, for the proposed general plan amendment, applicants are requesting to change the current designation of industrial to uh, very low density residential and uh, change the current zone designation of a planned research and development park zone to single family residential zone. Um, the proposed lot subdivision meets all code requirement except for the lot width requirement. Uh, for lot number four and lot number eight. Um, because the project site is adjacent to Alejo Road, which is a secondary thoroughfare, uh, the greater lot width is required for these lots. Uh, while the zoning code requires 130 feet minimum, uh, the applicant is proposing 117 and requesting administrative minor modification approval for the proposed lot width. Um, the proposed project meets the requirements of the California government code uh, for the general plan amendment and uh, requiring findings for the proposed change of zone, uh, tentative track map, and administrative minor modifications, uh, subject to approval of applications altogether. And then also uh, the state law requires uh, the city to study potential environmental impact as a part of the general plan amendment process and the mitigated ne negative declaration has been prepared. And the staff finds that the implementation of the mitigation measures will reduce the anticipated environmental impact less than significant. And then also the single family residential use will contribute to relieving the statewide housing shortage crisis. Uh, based on these findings, uh, staff is recommending the planning commission um, the following action to the city councils subject to conditions of approval that are included in exhibit A uh, of the staff report. Uh, the first, adopt the mitigated negative declaration as an adequate environmental document for the proposed project and associated impacts. The, uh, number two, approve case uh, 5.1521 general plan amendment and uh, to change the current land use designation from industrial to very low density residential and approve the change of zone from the current designation of a research and development park uh, to single family uh, residential and approve uh, tentative track map to subdivide the uh, 2.53 acre project site into eight single family residential parcels. And uh, lastly, approve case uh, 7.1645, uh, which is an administrative minor modification uh, to reduce the code required 130 foot minimum lot width to 117 for lot four and lot eight. And uh, this concludes the staff presentation. Uh, the applicant is here as well as um, the representative uh, from the consulting company that uh, worked on the, uh, the environmental studies. Thank you. Does anyone on the commission have questions for staff? Being none, oh, uh, I just have a question, um, and this was relative to the comments brought up by Mr. Malone in the public um, hearing. They dealt more with, uh, as I gather, more concerned about the heavy truck traffic on Aleo Road, um, and this is something that one would believe that with um, having regular vehicles for residential would not increase or exacerbate the problem. Um, but I'm wondering if there was any concern by staff about just the opposite. Uh, will the existing heavy traffic 
of trucks on a Leo be um, a problem for the residential lots, for eight residential lots? And also, are there any plans, capital improvement plans in the future for doing anything to a Leo that would change the, the conditions that were discussed? Um, when staff conducted the site visit, staff didn't notice uh, some of the, uh, I believe it's a UPS tracks that are parked on Alejo and the commercial road size. However, once this subdivision takes place and the residential development will happen, obviously those vehicles will not be uh, blocking the driveway or anything um, like that. In terms of uh, traffic that's coming from the rental car agencies and uh, nearby industrial properties, unfortunately, that's not something that the staff can really regulate. With regards to your question about the, uh, the potential capital improvement projects, uh, I refer the questions to our engineering staff to see if he can share any information with us tonight. Uh, good evening. Um, there are no immediate uh, capital improvement um, projects slated for that part of Alejo Road. Um, although I wanted to add that I did have a brief meeting with UPS probably um, about two, three weeks ago, um, because they are actually planning an expansion of their project. And I explained to them the need um, for them to, you know, reevaluate their parking, their on-site um, operations, um, because this subdivision was going to be occurring. So they are aware that they um, are going to be not really, they're not really being impacted, but they're, they are aware that the practices that they have been um, used to in the past are, are not gonna be able to continue. So they, they are aware of that. So we are come having those conversations with them. Thank you. Senator Miller had a question. Uh, yes. Have, have you um, my question I think is for staff. Um, but may ultimately involve the applicant as well. Uh, on lots one and lots five, it appears that there's some improvements sort of extending over from the commercial to the north, including potentially their driveway off of commercial road. The scale is a little difficult to see on our plans, but it is, am I reading that correctly, Noriko, where it appears that the, the curb cut onto the commercial property off of commercial road is on the subject property. I know there's some easements that are there, but it looks like there might be some physical improvements as well. Unless, um, again, the scale might be throwing me off on the plans. Is that a question that's more appropriate to ask of the applicant? It, it certainly could be. Noriko, can you answer that question or shall we defer that? Yes, um, I request the direct, um, excuse me, the questions to be uh, directed to the applicant. Uh, Vice Chair Roberts, you have your hand up. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, my question does not relate to this specific question that's uh, been brought up. I do want to um, discuss the concept of adding any conditions to this approval about moving forward with a residential development that sits on the fringe of an industrial area. In other words, I'm, what I'm concerned about is future homeowners or future um, HOAs uh, trying to sue the city and or industrial uses around this development. And I'm wondering if there's any language that we can insert that would go into the CCNRs of this development um, that they are very clear that they are on the edge of an industrial area and an airport. And there could be quite a bit of noise, um, specifically, um, on the street that leads directly to the UPS station. 
uh, and I think it was Mr. Malone earlier that brought up the concern about the tractor trailers that bring the rental cars back and forth to the rental lots. And this is the corridor that they use, Alejo. So the noise levels on this particular block are going to be particularly high on at least two sides. I want to get staff's take and the attorney's take on whether some language wouldn't be warranted here for this approval. As an indemnification for the city and or to ensure that the CCNRs for future buyers of these parcels are aware of, of the potential noise issues that will definitely be part of this new block of residential. Um, this project has been actually reviewed by the Riverside County Airport Land Use uh, Commission already, and uh, their conditions are included in the uh, the draft uh, resolution exhibit A. Um, so, the Riverside County Airport Land Use Commission is requiring uh, the information to be provided to the prospective. Uh, buyers of the properties showing the location of the aircraft flight patterns and the frequency over flights and whatnot. Um, but that's just for the airport use portion only. So thank you. And that's important. Um, I'm wondering if we need any language for the city as well. Um, because the I think the majority of noise, um, well, I won't say majority, but the, there's very direct noise on Alejo and to the direct line against the development that goes to the UPS um, station. And there are fleets, huge fleets of trucks, large trucks that go back and forth on these streets all day long, particularly in the morning when they take off and when they return in the evenings. So I'm hoping staff or the attorney can respond to this. Yeah, I think uh, as you'll notice in the conditions, we do have the CCNRs um, as a requirement that the applicant provide those as a part of our review. Um, so within that, we can um, have a stipulation that the developer must disclose um, these, uh, this, the, the surrounding land uses might uh, be impactful. And I think uh, Mr. Leishman has some specific language that uh, he can provide to the commission. You, we can let the developer speak to this, but I, I, and maybe suggest language or help us with this. I just want to ensure the buyers of these parcels are very clear on the impacts uh, on, on this development. Where, which condition is, requires the CCNRs? It's on, on page five of your um, resolution conditions. So it's the first two on that ADM one and two. But it's not under the PLNs. We would need to add conditions. Yeah, and we, we do have um, the in noise impact non-suit covenant zone that uh, this property may be within as well. And in that case, they do need to file a um, navigation easement and non-suit covenant with the city. Um, so that would also be applicable here if uh, the project is certainly, I believe, it is within the noise overlay zone. So can you can you basically write while we're doing the public hearing uh, a condition for us that requires the CCNRs the disclosure of the noise impact so that you can read it back to us, please? Yes, Madam Chair. That would be great. That's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open the public hearing. The app, if the applicant is here, you have 10 minutes. I'm here. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Adam Gilbert. I'm a third generation resident of Palm Springs and I'm an attorney, real estate broker and developer. Um, interesting kind of history on this particular parcel with me and why I'm bringing this project forward is I actually at one time had the listing on this lot. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of the uses that were being presented 
to me as possible uses on this land and industrial, heavy industrial uses just did not fit in one with the neighborhood. And two, because of the impact that you were mentioning previously, whether it be the airport, um, the UPS, um, and some of the other industrial uses um, already had on the existing neighborhood, um, I thought that having another heavy industrial, whether it be self-storage, this is a few years back, so many cannabis projects were being proposed, battery storage would be too much of an impact on the existing neighborhood already. Um, and so that is why, you know, one, um, I first went to the Sunburn neighborhood, um, discuss with them what are some of the impacts that are happening um, in your neighborhood, how can we help to alleviate them. Um, I got great feedback, especially from many of the neighbors on Juanita, um, where cars were being parked over on this lot um, and on the, the side streets. And I heard from them, you know, the impacts that they were facing. Um, and so it was at that point that I knew that bringing, taking it from a heavy industrial use more in line with the community and more in line with the housing development that was already there into a very low density residential project was going to be the best fit for the neighborhood to reduce the impact of these industrial uses in and around the neighbors. And so, um, uh, you know, that was one of the, to address Mr. L Malone's comments earlier, that was one of the things that I wanted to address. Um, and so we're happy to work with all of uh, the commissioners, with staff, to see how we can further alleviate, you know, the impact of the UPS trucks, uh, whether it's speed bumps or slow down signs, so they're not driving so fast down uh, Commercial Road and down Alejo so that we can work to make this a great community uh, for future housing and uh, make it a positive impact on Palm Springs and the neighborhood. Um, in regards to any technical questions, I have uh, Mr. Alan Sanborn, who is uh, our architect and engineer on the project. And uh, thank you again for hearing this. I'm here to answer any questions and uh, we look forward to bringing a great new project to Palm Springs. Uh, Mr. Newell, are there any members of the public who indicated they would like to speak? Uh, not directly to staff, but I would open it up to anyone who is here at the meeting tonight. And uh, please unmute the microphone and state your name for the record. No additional requests, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, then it's questions of the applicant. I have one or two along this the same line. Um, staff has said that they are requiring CCNRs. Does that work? Or do you have CC? Are you anticipating CCNRs for this development? So um, you know, I you know, initially the idea was either to have eight separate custom home lots. Um, or to do a, you know, again, we're not talking about the, um, the individual homes that will be there, but that is a potential. Um, I didn't necessarily want to box in this particular project with a housing development that would be subject to um, CCNRs or limitations. Um, however, I'm happy to have some sort of covenant in regard to the specific issue being addressed um, but I would not want it to potentially impact the ability of people to do um, custom home sites on these lots. Um, that would be, you know, obviously would have to go through the, the process of architectural review and planning. Um, but I, I didn't necessarily, you know, want to require a development with CCNRs here. If you have CCNRs, you could do design, some design guidelines. Uh, my understanding is that. Uh, these projects would not go back, these homes would not go back through architectural review and planning because they're on flat lands. Uh, and it would be over, it would be an over the counter situation. I share Mr. Uh, Vice Chair Roberts' concerns that what we do have is an industrial zone and we don't want to take away from the industrial zone uh, the use of that zone as it has 
previously occurred, not in all, I mean, not cars and trucks threatening lives, but uh, their ability to use those roads as befits their the business that they've established there. So probably some kind of CCNRs make sense so that there can be adequate, um, Mr. Newell, do, is there any other form? I would assume that to require the kind of notice we're talking about um, to neighbors, you probably do need CCNRs. Our, yeah, the current conditions do require that CCNRs be submitted. The um, alternate to that would, well, to address the um, Mr. Gilbert's comments about not wanting to require design review, um, you know, that certainly could be stipulated in the CCNRs that design review is not required and each lot shall be developed um, without review from an, you know, from the HOA or any HOA. Um, alternatively, the commission could require that there be deed restrictions that address these for each of the lots if CCNRs were not the desired approach, but I defer to our city attorney to um, provide any additional comments that you know, he might have ideas on. Chair Wormick, I, I just want to clarify, and for the applicant as well, I, I think that this is a really good use for this particular parcel. I, my understanding from the application and meeting with the applicant prior to our meeting was that the developer intends to sell the parcels off. It all makes sense. It's a good use for the land. I think the impact on the residential neighborhood, it will be a positive impact. All I'm looking for here is really some sort of disclosure that protects the city in the future from buyers of those parcels to ensure that they know they are coming into the, they are coming onto the edge of an industrial area that is extremely active and can be very noisy. So it's really more of a disclosure than anything else. I just, I, I know by saying this, it's entering our record, but I'd like us to ensure that the developer has some sort of disclosure of this as well um, to indemnify us. I'm happy to do that. For the attorney, is this, I, I would assume this could be done with a deed restriction so that it would pass with the property. So there was notice as well as CCNRs. Certainly, there, Madam Chair and Commission, it, the, what I'm hearing from the Commission is the need for disclosures, whether that's through a CCNR, through a deed restriction, or through some other seller disclosure requirement. There are, there are numerous ways to solve this problem. If we write a generic condition of approval requiring uh, seller disclosure of the surrounding uses to be approved by the city attorney at the city attorney's reasonable discretion, we can figure out what the best tool is. If the applicant decides to go with a common interest development, we can fold it into the CCNRs. If the applicant decides not to do a common interest development with CCNRs, then we can come up with the other appropriate recorded notice or deed restriction. Really, it's not so much a deed restriction because we're not restricting what they can do with the property. It's more a notice. Uh, but That's what I'm suggesting is simply some sort of a notice yeah, that goes and, with the parcels. If we write the condition or if we impose a condition that's just crafted as a, as a disclosure uh, to be approved by the city attorney at the city attorney's reasonable discretion, we can come up with something that does that and that doesn't hinder the uh, the saleability of the property. As long as it's on, as long as it's noticed through the deed, so subsequent buyers are aware of it. If it's on record title, it will, the world will be put on notice. That sounds like a great solution. So uh, we can, we'll, we, do we have a motion? Is that a motion, Commissioner Roberts? Yes, it's a motion to approve as presented with the condition that there's a permanent disclosure with the deeds about the sound impacts that isn't that will be inherent in this development. Second. So we I would just note for the record, sound impacts and adjacent land use impacts relative to traffic, because there are other traffic issues as well. And maybe rather than sound noise impacts, right. industrial noise impacts noise on this parcel. 
and also airport use. I mean, that is in the CCNRs, but it's it's the the adjacent uses. Yeah, the uh, airport stuff's already in there. Yep. Madam Chair and Commission, may I just, for clarity on the record, the motion would be to approve with uh, the addition of a condition that requires the applicant to require written notice to all buyers of adjacent land uses and noise impacts. Am I missing anything there? Uh, it would be it would be more than all buyers. It would be something that passes with the land. So it'd be in a in a form in a recordable form to be approved by the city attorney at the perfect. city attorney's reasonable discretion. In a recordable form, does it for me? That's it. That works. Commissioner Miller, you, you yeah, know, just under discussion. I still had that outstanding question regarding whether or not there are commercial improvements on lots one and five. Can anyone answer that question? Um, because it appears that there are. <laughs> Mr. Gilbert, is there anything built on this land? Um, there is a like former concrete pad um, that is there, which will be demolished and removed. Um, I believe as part of the environmental review, it had no distinguishing or value or features, um, but I believe that there is a concrete, just like an old foundation. Okay, there's no structures other than former foundations. So Mr. Mr. Miller was referring to the wall that extends over the property line that we call out on as easement note number one, and maybe Mr. Sanborn can address the specifics about that easement. Yeah, it's a reciprocal easement for access between the two properties. So it quite easily could have part of the driveway, part of the wall drops down onto the property. And that's what the easement's for. So in, a, in effect, lots one and five are uh, encroached upon by the driveway, which I don't necessarily have a problem with, but I want to, I would like to know that there was going to be a wall constructed uh, or some sort of privacy measure constructed for the benefit of the future homeowners um, because that's essentially on their property. Yeah, I would, I would assume there would be a wall constructed at the south edge of the easement. Are we requiring that now because we're not we're merely we're approving um, the change the change of use and a range of things where the the wall and the privacy will come in later when we uh, when there's staff appro staff approval of the application or do, are you looking to put something in right now into this approval? I, I'm certainly not looking to put anything in. Um, I just wanted to bring it to everyone's attention and make sure I was reading the plans correctly. I want to say now, I, I think this is a good use here. Um, this is one of those difficult sites that has been on the periphery of a, an industrial zone. And as the applicant stated, um, I mean, this, this is a difficult property and we're going to see more of these properties. I think we saw one on Sunrise Boulevard recently or Sun, Sunrise Way recently where single family homes were being proposed and there's going to be more pressure for single family to be approved. And I, I wholeheartedly support this. I just wanted to be clear on whether there was any encroachments that we needed to be concerned about affecting those lots at the Northern end, but I'm satisfied with the, with the answers that I've gotten. Uh, before I go forward for Mr. Newell and our attorney, if if there's a motion, does that cover all of the items we need to approve or do we need to take separate votes? You could do it either way. What's the, uh, I'm not sure what the custom has been in the city. Sorry, Madam Chair, I missed some of the uh, proceeding. I was interrupted, someone came to my window, so. Uh, the, the question is, do we need to take separate votes on the, ver on the various items or is it a single, a single approval? Uh, it's, six items. 
Yeah, we have we have one resolution for your consideration and adoption. If you do so, to approve the project and recommend it for council. Uh, so we would include the conditions you've provided to us relative to disclosure um, in reportable form. And I think that was the only added condition unless I missed an additional comment from Mr. Miller. Um, so if that's, that's the only condition, that's what we have currently um, in the motion. The other point I would just make is that based on what um, what the applicant has stated tonight and what we have in our conditions, they might be contrary to what we what we have in the draft conditions before you. So in the event that the CCNRs are not required or not being proposed, as these will be individual, um, not common interest, then we would remove those conditions um, or um, not require CCNRs be submitted. So this motion would include removing the condition that CCNRs be submitted with our motion substituting for it, correct? Yes, that's what it sounds like. Okay, it, for the maker and the seconder, is that your understanding? That is my understanding. For the maker of the motion? I believe that was the vice chair. That's who I'm calling on. Vice Chair Roberts, is that your understanding? Yes, it is. Uh, would you call, call the roll, please? Vice Chair Roberts? Yes. Commissioner Leon? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Chair Wormick? Yes. And project is comment that this is a great project and I fully support it. Thank you all very much. Sure. Before we continue on to the next item, may I just note that I'm getting a lot of feedback and, and uh, background noise going on. And if we could ask people who are not currently speaking to the commission to remember to mute their uh, speakers or their microphones, I would certainly appreciate it. Um, thank you, Commissioner. I'm getting that too. Is the distortion um, something to do with this particular call and is staff getting the distortion as well? And it's what the distortion I'm getting is in voices, sort of like a bad cell connection. Yeah, I think it's an echo from some, maybe Chair, it might be your speaker that's reverberating or echoing. That's where I'm getting it most from is the chair. Sorry, now you're muted, Madam Chair. Um, fine. I will mute when I'm not speaking. Uh, the next item before us is item 2C, the City of Palm Springs for approval of the annual update of the Palm Springs Zoning Code. Staff report, please. <clears throat> Madam Chair and Planning Commissioners, um, as you'll recall, we typically do an annual update to the Zoning Code to correct errors, clean up issues, um, that we've identified over the past year um, and address other matters that have been brought to staff's attention uh, relative to the zoning code. Uh, so let me share my screen and make the presentation. So for this year's updates, we have several items that we are making changes to relative to corrections um, or changes uh, either in state law um, or other, other matters. But um, the first item that I wanna mention, and this is in attachment A of your uh, staff report, uh, child daycare facilities, not child daycare facilities, currently is permitted by land use permit 
in residential zones, uh, and those are specifically identified in the table. Uh, under, under SB 234, Senate Bill 234, uh, that went into effect last year, uh, it does currently prohibit cities throughout California from requiring any type of permit or license if they are operating um, in accordance with state law. And so what we're proposing is to revise any area which is a large daycare um, to be permitted by right to be consistent to be consistent with state law. Currently, we allow small daycares in these residential zones by right. But basically, this changes it to allow small and large daycares by right in the residential zones currently um, where they're permitted. Uh, another topic that we're trying to revise in the code with this update is the condominium and hotel, uh, condominium hotels and timeshares. Specifically, we currently identify in the zoning code in various multifamily and hotel zones and some commercial districts where timeshares are permitted by conditional use permit. We do not currently identify condo hotels anywhere in the zoning code aside from section 93, which is our general conditions and standards um, section. And in that section of the code, it does state that plan development districts are required for any condominium hotel. Uh, this is a process that was established in 2008 and given the changes that we've made to the plan development district ordinance and moving away from requiring plan developments, um, we would like to modify the ordinance to state that condominium hotels are permitted in the same zones where we allow timeshares, uh, as well as remove the plan development district requirement and only require conditional use permit consistent with what the process currently is for timeshares. Um, so that is another change that we are recommending as part of the changes. The city uh, has a somewhat dated trash enclosure ordinance. We do identify recycling containers as being required as a part of that ordinance. As you probably know, SB 1383 now requires city um, to cities to accommodate organic waste as of January 1st. Uh, so we are proposing changes to our ordinance to accommodate organic waste containers in the proposed update. Street improvement requirements. Um, currently in, our, in section 93 of the zoning code, we do identify what is required relative to permits for street improvements or street dedications as a part of any building permit application that the city has. We also identify where a dedication is currently not required um, when someone applies for a, bu a building permit, but we don't have any language right now that specifies improvements um, when improvements are not required. So what our proposal is in the current update is to um, update the code to be consistent with our current practice, which is really to not require street improvements for um, minor um, building permits that uh, really don't necessitate the city um, or provide a nexus for the city to uh, require street dedication. Um, so we're really trying to just make it consistent with what is currently in the street improvement section of 9309 of the zoning code. There are uh, several cleanup items. Um, as you recall, last year, we were trying to nail down the definition of a youth center relative to a cannabis use and its proximity to that uh, dance studio. So we've included a definition of a youth center in the um, definitions list um, for the update and included private facilities to be included in that definition. We revised the um, ADU description uh, to current terminology in the list of uses permitted by CUP. So under the ADU ordinance, type three uh, ADUs, which are not the, not obviously not the type one or type two are really the larger type ADUs. Uh, under the ADU ordinance that does require a CUP, we still have an old um, reference in the code in the R1 list of permitted uses that we're trying to clean up and really just clarify that it's only the type three ADUs that require conditional use permit. We'd like to add a development standard in the R1 zone prohibiting um, individuals and property owners from um, paving a majority of their front yard. 
Um, we've experienced uh, currently um, someone who has uh, paved over a majority of the front yard. So uh, in order to really reinforce that the city would, uh, would not allow that, um, we would like to add something in our code to address that. So we have that proposal in the code um, update this year. We're trying to correct an error that was uh, omitted in the recent update to the cannabis ordinances. Um, specifically in the M1P and over cannabis overlay zone, we omitted that the um, that within that area, man, cannabis manufacturing is permitted by conditional use permit. So we're cleaning that up, and that was identified in the staff report. But again, as I said, it was omitted from the actual ordinance that was adopted. We're making revisions to the Hillside Ordinance to reflect ARC as an approval body to be consistent with the changes we made last year to the architectural review and development permit process in section 94 of the zoning code. Um, we're making a recommendation that you adopt a prohibition in our prohibited signs section relative to parked vehicles that are that have signs either painted or um, applied to the vehicle that are intended to attract attention to a business or product where the vehicle is parked. Uh, and then um, we would like to add an exception for non-conforming covered parking. Um, currently, as you know, under our ADU ordinance, people can apply to convert a garage space to an ADU. So we're just clarifying that that um, does not require replacement of that covered parking in accordance with our ADU ordinance, uh, as well as anyone who chooses to remodel or expand their residence is not required to expand covered parking if it is currently non-conforming. Uh, as you know, we have a lot of mid-century homes that do not have parking spaces that meet current standards due to a smaller garage. We just wanted to clarify that um, they don't explicitly in our code that they do not need to um, provide additional or a, a new large garage space. Uh, and there's some other minor changes in the code that we're proposing. Um, and those are really just corrective or gr grammatical changes or references to um, a director or a city engineer uh, or other minor changes like that. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation. I am happy to answer commission questions, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, you're muted. Uh, I typically don't mute myself because oh. I have to function as a chair. So I've been trying to respect your requests, but it's difficult. Uh, Commissioner Ryan, did you have a comment or is this a motion to approve? No, it's it's uh, a question really, or an observation and a request for help or suggestions. Um, and that is on the item that is trying to prevent the use of commercial vehicles as advertising devices by parking them outside for businesses. That's a pretty common thing for people who want to do, for businesses to do. And I agree that getting some sort of um, handle on it would be a good thing, and it certainly would improve the aesthetics of the community in, in general. However, I think that the way this is worded is not really going to accomplish that end because all it takes is for the uh, business to simply move their, it's usually a truck or, you know, with painted, something painted on the side. All they have to do is move it every three days, you know, move it to a different parking space. Um, and most business owners are clever enough to figure that out quickly. So I'm wondering, and this might in part be a question for the city attorney, if there's something that we can do that, um, in, in light of the fact that what we're trying to um, regulate is commercial speech, not protected First Amendment speech, um, is there some, and probably you're working with the streets, uh, 
the, the state streets codes, which um, allow you to park 72 hours on the street. Um, is there some other way that we could accomplish this so that it's just easily skirted by somebody moving their truck every three days? Uh, and, uh, Commissioner Lamb, we actually um, found this code in West Hollywood's code. They have the same provision in their sign ordinance as a prohibited sign type. Um, it does say 24 hours. We moved it to 72 um, just to be consistent with vehicle code, but um, others in other cities currently limiting it to no more than 24 hours. So we could consider that. And I don't know if Mr. Lucian has concerns with that. Hopefully not. But <laughs> as I said, another city is currently doing that. Mr. Leishman, do you have any ideas? Madam Chair and Commissioner, it's code enforcement uh, on a lot of these, uh, especially when it comes to uh, violations that move around, parking violations in particular. Sometimes we don't want to rely on just chalking tires and circling back 24 or 72 hours later and see if if the chalk is still there. It, it's always a challenge. Um, certainly cities like West Hollywood are making it work with a 24 hour requirement. Uh, I suggest adopting the rule and then adapting to whatever enforcement challenges arise in application rather than trying to solve that problem up front. It might be that the 72 hour or the or a 24 hour like West Hollywood that it works just fine. I think um, most often complaints drive enforcement and we'll see that uh, we'll see that happen here too. Okay, then, uh, Madam Chair, I would, I would suggest that uh, when we come time to making a motion that, that that include changing that from 72 hours to 24 hours. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments for, uh, this is a public hearing, so we're at questions for staff and yeah. um, Commissioner Miller. I just have one, um, just a couple of comments. Is this the appropriate time to to mention where I think there's a word or two missing in the proposed language? If, if I could do that now. On uh, item number six on the exhibit attachment A rather regarding- I'd like to do that after the public hearing. Okay, that's fine. Uh, is, there, is there anyone else? Um, before we have comments, are there any members of the public who wish to speak? Mr. Newell? No, but if anyone is on the call this evening that would like to speak, please unmute yourself and I, unmute your microphone and identify yourself. Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. We'll go back to Commissioner Miller. Yeah, on um, item number six on attachment A, uh, let me go back. There may be the word for FOR might be missing under B uh, regarding the um, paving in the front yard. The um, third line up from the bottom where it says the remainder of said front yard may be used for off street parking. I think that's a simple typo. Do you see where I'm referring to that? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And then just a question on item 11, page four, to a, the new language that's proposed. I'm I'm wondering if there's not a word missing there as well. I'm just having a little bit of difficulty com completely comprehending all that's being said in that 2A. It's talking about um, e exclusions for street improvements. Um, when a building permit has been issued for remodeling, the remodeling does not involve extensive construction of the front of the building. 
and then it gets a little muddled where it says where it would not where it would be possible to conform to required setbacks. I'm not sure. Is there an and where it would not where it would be possible to conform to required setbacks? Should there be an and in there? Or is that missing a not? I'm just not sure exactly what that's saying. The the, cons mm -hmm. the extensive construction of the front and it would be possible to conform to required setbacks. That is excluding street improvements from being done. Um, it could be further. It's just a little, and seemed, seemed a little, um, a little wordy or confusing. Yeah, if you go back to the previous page, that's what we currently have in our ordinance on page three under 2A, um, but both of those probably could be cleaned up. Something to look at. That's all I have for questions. Are there other, Commissioner Roberts, is your hand up or? No, that's just. No, I'm just sort of in awe of Commissioner Miller and I'm grateful for him. Me too. I have one question and it's just for my own information. Is a large daycare anything over, over six children? Yeah, large daycares are up to 13, I believe, is our current definition. So it's Eight to thirteen, or I'm just. Madam Chair and Commission, it, it's actually kind of a fuzzy line. The the line between small and large under state law, the number can be over six or over eight, depending on uh, how many of the children are children of the operator. Up, to, I think it's over six, but one to two. I think a small can be up to six, but they can also add their own children up to one or two children. So that makes small up to eight if you include their own kids and large can be, um, large is similarly fuzzy. So um, all that is to say is that it's kind of in that six to eight up to 13, 14 range. Yeah, we said we indicate 14 in our current definition. Okay, um, Commissioner Land. Yes, thank you. I have uh, two suggestions. One is on the definition of a youth center. Um, <clears throat> I would suggest that we say that the facility is primarily used to host recreational, social, or educational activities for minors, uh, given that there are a lot of uh, homework or tutoring type of centers that that might pick up. And then in the resolution itself, um, the third finding, finding C, we're referring to the director of planning services, and I don't believe that that position exists anymore. We might have now, uh, that might be outdated and need to be updated. We are currently recruiting for a director of planning, actually. I'm sorry? Uh, the city is um, currently recruiting for the director of planning, so that position will be reinstated. I stand corrected. If I'm taking a motion, there are no more comments on this. Taking a motion to approve. We have um, changes in section one, adding the words or educational for minors. Um, on the automobile, I'm not sure which section that is. Mr. Newell, if you could help, or oh, off-street parking. It's number 13. Number 13, we are changing 72 hours to 24 hours. And we are... Um, I believe we're adding the word four on item 5B for off-street parking. 
uh, number six on page two, 5B. On the third line from the end. And then there was a section that was going to get a little bit of cleanup um, under street dedications. Is that? Um, under 2, uh, 11.2a and 2b, there is some grammatical cleanup required. Yeah, I'll, I'll work with our engineer to refine that um, based on what we're currently doing in practice and make sure it's consistent for both 2a and uh, d2a and e2a. So we are recommending, our vote would be to recommend this to city council, am I correct? Correct. Uh, can I take a motion with those changes? So moved. And is there a second? Second. Uh, can you call the roll, please? Commissioner Lane? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Uh, let's see, Vice Chair Roberts? Yes. Chair Wormick? Yes. Motion approved five with two absent. Thank you. Uh, we are at 7.30. We have two, two remaining items on the agenda. I'd like to go through those unless anybody needs a break. Commissioner Hirschbein is requesting a five minute break. Um, we will reconvene at uh, 7.30. That's a seven minute break.
Thank you. Uh, we're on item three, which is unfinished business. Uh, Hawkins and Marshall, and it's item 3A and 3B. I think we had indicated that the applicant could speak for five minutes. Should we do that, Mr. Newell, before the staff reports on those and do handle them in a combined fashion, or shall we handle that separately? Uh, I would recommend having the staff presentation and then the applicant make his presentation and fill in any gaps that he would like to address. And so we will have him only speak on one of the items, assuming that's speaking on both items. Um, if we're taking these as um, joint um, reviews, then he would only speak once. But if we're going to take. Why don't we take them as joint reviews with separate um, uh, separate motions on the two items? Okay. So we we're going to be handling this jointly. Uh, it is item 3A, Hawkins and Marshall, on behalf of Carmelita Properties Limited for a major architectural and administrative minor application to construct a 3,278 square foot single family residence on a 15,178 square foot hillside parcel located at 310 West Crest Crestview Drive. And item 3B is Hawkins and Marshall on behalf of Carmelita Properties Limited for major architectural and administrative minor modification applications to construct a 3,344 square foot single family residence on an 11,206 square foot parcel located at 322 West Crestview Drive. Uh, staff reports, please. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> As introduced, this is a proposed single family residence at 310 West Crestview Drive. So, here. Uh, the project site is an un undeveloped hillside property in the Mesa neighborhood, which is adjacent to other vacant lot to the west. And this is just to show the site's topography and the existing condition of the site. The, as, you, as you can see here in the topography uh, drawing, uh, the site's topography slopes down from the front to the rear. The applicant is proposing to construct a residence, which is 3,278 square feet, containing uh, 2,775 square feet of living area and a 503 square foot garage um, on the 15,173 square foot lot. The proposed lot coverage is um, approximately 21.6%. Uh, then, then excuse me, an applicant is proposing the maximum building height of 23.3 feet. And can I ask one question? Uh, since some of the lot is excluded um, because it's got more than a 30 foot slope, can you tell us what the lot coverage is in terms of the portion of the parcel you can count uh, for lot coverage? The lot coverage um, is based on the entire lot size, not the based on the slope. So in this case, the lot coverage was calculated um, based on the proposed residence size, which is 3,278 square feet, divided by the lot size of 15,173 square feet. Um, may, may I continue or? Yes, uh, maybe Mr. Newell will be able to answer that question later. Um, so that we can seeking uh, administrator minor modification approval for the proposed building height and a 10 foot front yard setback. Um, as, you, as you may recall, this project was reviewed by the planning commission on the January 12th. And at the meeting, uh, the planning commission requested the applicant to provide a certification of a story pole accuracy uh, from the installing engineer and the surveyor 
and the story pole installation to be with a ribbon or string between the poles to clearly show the proposed massing. And uh, also requested the applicant to submit a revised renderings uh, to uh, accurately depict the proposed structures, including the following uh, specific changes. Uh, the pier designed uh, to be shown where proposed and the reduction of a one foot height as outlined in the conditions and provide a landscape plan that includes proposed, um, excuse me, revisions actually, it's a typo, recommend by the ARC. Um, so after the January 12th meeting, the applicant uh, installed a story poll according to the specifications required by the planning commission and submitted a certification uh, the story poles that are installed at the site, uh, the story poles are installed at the corners of the building segments and uh, to represent the building height. And uh, each pole was connected with a ribbon to outline the proposed building. And uh, these are the images of the story poles that are installed by the applicant. And the uh, applicant submitted uh, the renderings uh, to show and to respond to the planning commission's comments. Um, at the last meeting, the planning commission required the depiction of the piers. And in this case, the, the project site is over here, 310 uh, Crestview Drive, which shows the pier structure under the building. And then also the planning commission requested a one foot building height reduction uh, required by the condition However, the one foot high reduction was not recommended for this particular project. And actually that was recommended for 322 Crestview, which is the project to the West. I just like to point that one out. And this is a rear elevation, the north view of the proposed project. And this is a street facing elevation. And since the January 12th, Planning Commission meeting, the applicant has made some changes to the landscape plan. Uh, the image on the left side is what was previously proposed. And then the image on the right side is the one that's been uh, proposed as a revision. As you see, uh, the revision shows an increased amount of planting materials, particularly in the rear yard. Uh, however, staff finds that uh, this particular arrangement, the linear orientation of the trees appears a little ordery for the existing natural hillside landscape and the topography. In addition to the requirements uh, presented by the planning commission, the applicant has made some minor changes to the previously proposed plan. Um, the previous plan included a balcony on the east elevation. However, the applicant has removed the balcony which projected into the required setback area. And uh, and then also uh, the applicant made some changes, design changes to the treatment of the east elevation accordingly. As you see the image on the top included the balcony towards the rear of the house and that has been now changed to uh, the building wall which accommodate windows and some minor design changes are proposed to the window treatment for the mid section of the residence. Additionally, um, the applicant decided to omit uh, the 36 uh, roof overhang projection into the west side yard setback area, as shown here in the yellow on the right, excuse me, on the left side. And that portion has been uh, removed. And the revised plan on the right, right hand side shows that uh, the proposed building actually uh, conforms to the setback requirement in the side yard. And in addition to the changes, uh, the staff mentioned a minor change to um, the west elevation is also proposed, uh, particularly uh, the treatment of the building wall towards the end. As you see, there's a window, uh, whereas there was none proposed before. And uh, <clears throat> this is a rear elevation of the residence. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the balcony on the east elevation has been removed. And for the reason, um, the east side has been a little bit extended. Um, no overhang on balcony, it's just a building. 
And based on the revision, staff finds that the applicant has responded to planning commission's comments on the January 12th planning commission meeting. And the project is consistent with the intent of the general plan and meets the applicable development standards, except for the building height and the front yard setback. Um, and the applicant has submitted an administrative minor modification in accordance with applicable law. And the project generally meets the architecture review and the health site review criteria. And the uh, project meets the findings required for administrative minor modification approval. Um, and the staff is recommending conditions of approval for the project to fully meet the required findings um, and to address the following. Landscape plan needs to address the linear placement of trees in the rear yard for better compatibility with the site's natural hillside topography. And um, the revised landscape plan to be reviewed and approved by the Architectural Review Committee. Um, Staff is recommending the planning commission to approve the project subject to conditions of approval that are included in exhibit A of the draft resolution, uh, which includes the landscape design requirement to be revised. And uh, staff would like to point out that um, in the last few days, uh, the planning division has received multiple comments uh, regarding this project including a comments regarding CEQA, or more specifically, uh, uh, comments regarding applicability of a CEQA exemption. Um, the staff like to state that um, at this point, uh, the city has only received applications for the development of two lots, and there are no uh, proposed development plans on file for the remaining parcels that are owned by the applicant. And uh, based on the review of the project, uh, staff still uh, recommends adoption of a CEQA exemption at this point. And this concludes the staff presentation and applicant is available if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I'd like to bring the applicant forward and they have five minutes to present. Will we have a chance to ask staff questions? Can we do that after the applicant, or would you like to ask them now? Um, I guess it doesn't matter. I just had a question about an AMM. What is it? What does it mean? When is it applicable? And why is it? When would it be not an AMM? Um, AMM stands for Administrative Minor Modification, which allows the city to, or applicants to request uh, minor deviations from the applicable development standards. Uh, for this case, uh, the zoning code allows hillside uh, projects uh, to allow the, with the approval of administrative minor modification approval, the building height can be increased up to 30 feet. And then also allows a reduction in the front yard setback from typically required, required 25 feet to uh, 10 feet. And applicant uh, submitted application to request a 10 foot front yard setback. And in this case, 23.3 uh, foot building height. And administrative to me indicates that it's done at staff level. Is that not correct? Yes, for the building, um, for the building height, I'm sorry, for the hillside building height, um, the approval authority uh, is granted to the architecture review committee. However, the decision making body has the option of referring the matter to the planning commission uh, or the decision body if they determine that taking such an action is appropriate. So, so does it have to come before planning commission and or ARC or can staff do it on its own? No, it has to it has to be approved by the ARC. So it's not really administrative then, is it? No, it just the, the name is, I guess, the application is called. Administrative uh, minor modification can be applied in the in the different, I guess, to address the different issues when it comes to development. Uh, for instance, lot coverage can be increased, lot dimensions can be changed. By staff? Uh, some of them, some changes can be approved by the director of development services. But when it comes to the hillside building height and the front yard setback, 
uh, approval authorities, um, actually the architecture review committee. And is there any, is there any, um, uh, uh, um, is it by right that they get those changes? Um, I would not call it by right because there are findings that needs to be met. So if we cannot make those findings and we cannot grant the AM, AMM? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? You know, we've, uh, I'm gonna allow all questions of staff at this point. I have a couple. You said that there's a 10 foot setback in the front, but when, is that just to where the garage is located? Because it looks like most of the property is set back uh, to allow landscape in a pool and the majority of the house at, a fur at the further end. How do you treat that? How, did you, how do you think about the fact that you have this larger landscape area in between the garage and the house, the actual house? Um, so the, the project site is located in the... Uh, where, is the where is the 10 feet to? That's the question I'm asking. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it's from the property line to the, uh, the south elevation of the garage. And is it typical to allow this much landscape on a hillside lot in between the house, the garage and the house? There's no requirement with regards to the size of the landscape area. Uh, we do have a policy with regards to uh, paving the front yard, which cannot exceed the 50% of the front yard area. But if the applicant wish to provide a sufficient or large area of landscape space, then that is actually a part of uh, the design that they're proposing. And, it's not really the violation of any zoning requirement or policy. And then the earlier question that I asked going into, I guess the 30% slope area, you don't calculate for density. It, what's the difference between calculating that for density and lot coverage? So what, what calculations did you make regarding the percentage that was 30% uh, at slopes at 30%. The density requirement for a single family residential parcel is set, which is one single family dwelling unit per lot. So the specific language in the zoning code and which uh, assistant planner, excuse me, assistant director of planning uh, can confirm, but that density calculation stipulation is applicable for for instance, multifamily residentials or development that would require density calculations. Uh, but when, you, when it comes to this particular project, it's a single family residence where the density is already set. So the fact that it's got a 30% 30, 30 or greater slope doesn't impact your calculations at all? For density, no. Madam Chair, the only thing I would add to Ms. Kukuchi's comments or response is that the there's two there's two standards that um, that we have in our code. In the hillside ordinance, it talks about density and how you calculate density. When you're establishing a tract or a new subdivision in a hillside area, you are to exclude areas that are over 30% slope. So when you have an area that's over 30% slope, you shouldn't be excluding those areas from where buildable lots can be established. So that's one part of our zoning code. In our R1 standards, we have lot coverage, which is separate and independent from that 30% requirement. The maximum of 35% lot coverage is just um, across the entire lot that's been already, you know, that's been established as a part of a subdivision. So it's a separate um, formula that we arrive at based on the lot that has been established. And, and then the other question is, do you consider these two lots together when you're evaluating it in terms of the impact? Because we have, we have two lots and no hydrology report, but 
clear, clear issues with water uh, sloping down that entire site going across both home paths. And I'm, I'm just, I, I have a great deal of concern about the hydrology issue. And I, I want to understand how you consider these separately when they're abutting and they have the same hydrology issue. Um, I'm going to ask our engineering associate to respond to your question. Uh, good evening, Chair and Commission. Um, the hydrology um, is similar to both lots in the rear of the lot. Um, the hydrology is slightly different on the front of the lots um, just because of the uh, uh, drainage anomaly that's on the current slide that you currently see. Um, we've been working with the applicant's engineer for quite some time now. And initially, um, we were not on the same page with data and how um, the water was to be mitigated. Um, we have come quite a, quite a way since then, and we're only down to one aspect of the hydrology study that we don't um, agree to. Um, and that is the accumulation of water at Ridge Road and Crestview and how it would affect these lots. Um, but I can tell you at the end of the day, uh, myself, city engineer and our plan check engineer, as well as their hydrologist, um, at the end of the day, we're pretty confident that the water can be mitigated safely. Um, it won't impact anybody to the north or to the south. And they'll do some structure protection down at the bottom. Um, we don't have a lot of concern about the uh, flooding area in the bottom. And we did recently have some meetings with Department of Water Resources in regards to the FEMA. And they also indicated that they don't see it as an issue um, either. So we're, we're very confident that these projects can be built and the water be mitigated properly and safely. And uh, they just need to finish dialing in the numbers and resubmit their report. Thank you. I think those are my questions. Uh, if anybody else has questions. Seeing none, the applicant, if the applicant's here, you have five minutes and then if you would stay for questions. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, wanna thank you for the, the courtesy here to, to present briefly to you. Um, Noriko did a um, good job discussing the, the changes that were made from the previous submission, but um, I do just wanna briefly touch on, on this process as a whole. And then um, if possible, share a diagram that sort of reinforces the changes that were made from previous submission to now. Um, but as you, as you may know, this has been a long process for us um, dating back almost a year uh, when we had our first neighborhood outreach uh, meeting. And these projects are largely a, a product of, of the process to date, reflecting comments and concerns and recommendations from uh, neighbors, the city planning staff, city engineers, and the architectural review committee. Um, we've addressed and revised massing, building relationships to the surrounding topography, their heights, uh, relationship to neighbors' views, uh, grading and hydrology, and those are just a, a few um, that stand out. Uh, furthermore, as, as mentioned by Noriko, no variances are, are being requested or are required for either of these projects. And, and these are both, they were and, and are still reinforced by unanimous ARC approval and, and city staff approval. Um, so however, you know, after the original planning commission submittal and the subsequent discussion that, that took place um, it's still kind of apparent that maybe there are some issues with the perceived massing along the northern slope. So the changes that we made between the previous middle and now were to try to further reduce the impact along that facade um, or along that elevation um, as perceived by Camino and Ridge Road to the north. 
Um, this is these changes are reflected in the story polls that you saw and also the revised renderings. And uh, if possible, I, I could show a diagram just to briefly summarize these. Um, and some are reiterating what uh, Narika had mentioned, but she uh, didn't get a chance to talk about 322 yet. So I will touch on both at the same time. Is that possible, David, to share screen? Yes. So um, 310. Regarding 310, it's, it's highlighted here in blue, the, the changes that were made. Um, and the dashed lines here indicate uh, the previous uh, design. So uh, obviously one of the, the requests by both staff and, and the planning commission, you guys, was that um, piers as a structural foundation type were preferred to walls. Um, and that was, was, those changes were made and those are reflected uh, in the plans and the renderings. Uh, as Noriko mentioned, the west overhang was reduced actually by a total of 42 inches, um, and the east overhang was reduced um, by 63 inches, um, as well as the east deck being omitted. So neither of them encroach into the side yard setback uh, as of now, and uh, the both of those walls now sit back further uh, beyond the, the required setback. The overall, in addition to that, the overall building width from wall to wall uh, was reduced by one foot. So uh, in summary, we reduced the floor area by an additional 187 square feet on, on 310, as well as uh, reduce the length of the home as perceived uh, from the north. Uh, and then regarding 322 uh, highlighted here in red, we uh, pulled the projection, uh, the north, the upper floor, northern uh, facade, back three feet towards the south, increasing the setback from the property line, uh, the rear property line, to almost 42 feet now, as opposed to 39 feet. Uh, additionally, we reduced the floor area in the upper floor, and um, due to some uh, implications by structural and, and civil because we had to drop down into the um, into the hillside based on a previous ARC uh, condition. Uh, the lower corner here at the southwest corner um, has been simplified and squared off and resulting in, a, in an overall increase of floor area of 53 square feet um, from our previous uh, submittal. So those, in summary, those are the, the primary changes. And these were meant to make additional efforts to um, listen to what was mentioned at the previous um, hearing and do what we could in that mat, mat, matter of time to uh, further address it. Uh, additionally, you know, we've been months and months with uh, engineering going back and forth and extending our survey data. And, and we're, we're in the process, just to echo what Rick mentioned, um, we're just waiting on the final uh, additional survey data that's been requested by the plan check engineer. Um, and we hope to get that within the next few weeks. Um, as you know, every everyone is busy at the moment, but uh, that is in process and have been working tirelessly to, to, to get that uh, resolved. Um, additionally, David, I'm not sure if I have any more time, but there was a request uh, to a, respond to one of the neighbors, Amanda Ross. Um, she had a couple questions um, in regards to the renderings. Do I have time to, to respond to those? You can take the time, yes. So um, I'm just gonna read her question uh, in, in context here. She, she wrote on page 49 of, of item 3B, the foundation of 310 Crestview shows two very large song solid concrete foundation walls supporting the floor structure above it. And the dotted line on this plan is representative of the, of the main floor and therefore uh, main floor above and therefore supported by these concrete foundation walls. However, in the Photoshop renderings on page 42 and 43, these walls do not appear and instead show piers. Meanwhile, the elevation drawings on page 79 also show the faint outline of, of four columns, but no solid concrete walls. Um, and she, she references some exhibits. Um, Amanda, the, the exhibits you're referring to were the original submission that Noriko included in the report for reference. Um, 
But if you refer to page 67 in, this, in the new staff report, uh, it shows the proposed design of the foundation, including the piers. Um, and this is consistent with the revised renderings. Uh, next question was, additionally, renderings do not appear to match plans and the plan uh, drawings the, in, in all capitals. The roof height for 322 appears to be taller than 310. However, the renderings make the roof heights appear the same. The story poles appear to match the drawings, not the renderings. Please see page four, figure D. Uh, this appears to just be a matter of looking at it in 3D versus 2D. 322 pre projects beyond 310 uh, to the north, um, as you see in the plans. And from that vantage point and from the, where the photo was taken um, and the image rendered and matched to the photo with the story poles, uh, this is what you would see. These, the renderings and the story poles match um, and the story poles have been certified. If you look at the rendering viewed from below on Camino Way on page 86 of the staff report, you can see the height difference between the two structures. Um, and that is all I have in response to, um, to Amanda. And I appreciate the time to uh, you provided for us to present tonight. And I ask that you support the ARC and the planning staff by approving uh, these projects. Thank you. Uh, if you'd stay for questioners, questions, sure. uh, Vice Chair Roberts has his hand up. You're, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, um, uh, um, David, could you, uh, or Enrico, could you put up the uh, rear yard elevation, please, the rendering? Uh, you may have passed it. Uh, no, I'd actually like to see the rendering, please. The digital rendering. There, uh, and there's one that's actually stop there for a moment. Okay, could you also show us the more direct um, showing the two houses? So, there we go. So my question for the applicants is also a comment. Um, as planning commissioners, we're used to seeing a lot of fluffy landscaping covering buildings. Um, and in your case, you did a good job. My question to you is these plantings and trees that you're showing here, do you, are these actually part of your landscape plan? And if they are, are these natives plantings? Are these things we would find in this area naturally? So um, this elevation is, is a pretty accurate representation of the planting and the, the rendering from Camino, because uh, it would effectively render the buildings obscured, we reduced the planting a little bit for the, for the rendering purpose. Um, but the, we looked at the recommendation, the, the plant recommendations from, um, um, I forget the the entity, but it's a palm desert, um, you know, dry, drought tolerant landscape. These are Palo Verde trees primarily on on both properties. We have some desert acacias, um, and then some desert um, carpet, shrubbery, uh, and ground covers. So all of these are taken from recommend as recommended plants from um, your your region and county. Okay, um, Noriko, could you also show me the elevations of the front of these houses in, in the same in, in the digital renderings? Thank you. Okay, so my comment with my question is, it's it's very important that. Um, the landscape fit into this neighborhood. The Mesa has a very specific feel. It's a very earthy and natural feel. Um, so on the gully side, more than this front, um, it's important that you plant things that um, attract wildlife, hopefully reduce the visual impact 
of the undersides of these houses from uh, across on Ridge Road. Um, and uh, that's my only question and comment. Thank you. Are there other questions of the applicant? There being none, the matter is before the commission. Thank you very much. Oh, Noriko, do we have to, we have to do the other, we're commenting on both. So you only gave us one staff report, is that correct? Or did you do both? I have, I have prepared the presentation for uh, 322 West Crestview as well. It's a separate presentation. Then before it's before this goes to the commission, you should do that because we're going to consider both items together. Okay. Commissioner Roberts, did you have a comment on this? Yeah, Madam Chair, I'll just get my comment out of the way early and quickly. Um, these um, uh, these two houses have been through a tremendous amount of process. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I believe that they're probably a little bit big for their parcels. I have to say that I think the design is good. I think the applicant's gone a long way to making them work. The Mesa is full of pretty much everything, every style, every size, every scale. You're out of uh, order. If I'm sorry? Have, you're out of order. This is, that's part of discussion. And I, think I thought you just asked me for my comments. I thought you, I, I didn't realize that you were going to be going into um, almost emotion on that. Uh, if I'm not making emotion, I'm making comments. If uh, okay, this then, is not the time, I won't make them. Oh, well, I, I can't allow one person to make comments without everybody else being. Made. I didn't ask for a special time for it. You asked for comments. I, I was more going to questions. I'm sorry. Let's let's hold. I that. will wait. Uh, Noriko, can you present the other project, please? Sure. Um, so this is a presentation for 322 West Crestview Drive, which is adjacent to uh, 310 West Crestview Drive uh, that you just reviewed about five minutes ago. And uh, the project site is actually the west uh, vacant lot. And here is a topography uh, very similar to the adjacent lot. Uh, the slope goes down from the from the front to the to the rear. And the applicant is proposing to construct a 3,344 square foot residence on 11,206 square foot lot. The proposed lot coverage is approximately 20.7%. And the proposed building height is 25.8 feet. Uh, just like 310 Crestview, the applicant seeking administrative minor modification approval for the proposed 10 foot front yard setback, as well as the proposed building height. Um, at the January 12th Planning Commission meeting, uh, the Planning Commission requested the, the applicant to submit a certification of story poll accuracy. Uh, story for installation with ribbons and strings, uh, as well as the renderings uh, that shows the proposed project uh, accurately, including a period designs, as well as, as, well as a reduction uh, of one foot height as outlined in the condition and the landscape plan. Um, the applicant submitted a certification for the story pole installation, just, just like they did for the 310 West Crest View. And uh, staff visited the site and took these images and photos. And uh, the renderings that the applicant submitted actually shows both 310 and 322. And the uh, same rendering that you looked at earlier. And uh, street facing elevation of the proposed project. And here is the proposed changes to the landscape plan. As you see, um, additional planting materials being included in the revised plan. The design incorporates organic form, particularly in the rear. 
Uh, however, staff finds that the treatment of the front entry area where the acacia is proposed uh, can be improved uh, for considering the overall uh, uh, design uh, of the project. And as applicant uh, explained earlier during his presentation, um, in addition to the comments provided by the planning commission, uh, the applicant's team decided to uh, reduce the projection of the rear portion of the residence by, by three feet. And this is just to show how the three foot reduction affects the overall design. Uh, but as you see here, shown a pointed by a red arrow, uh, the projection of the upper level has been uh, reduced. And uh, this is just to show uh, the real elevation of the, uh, the Google's residence. Um, the submitted drawings still show a structural wall, not uh, piers, um, but just to show you what's being proposed here. And uh, there are no changes proposed to the west and uh, east elevation. I'm sorry, uh, this is, yes, this is actually based in the East. And uh, based on the submitted revised plans, the staff again finds that the project is generally consistent with the intent of general plan, uh, meets applicable development standards, except for the building height, uh, which can be uh, changed with approval of AMM, and uh, the project generally meets the architectural review and the hillside uh, review criteria as well as the findings required for administrative minor modification approval. Um, and the staff is recommending a conditions of approval uh, for the project to fully address the following concerns, which is the landscape design and the structural wall design. That said, the staff is recommending uh, the planning commission to approve the project subject to conditions of approval that are included in exhibit A, uh, which include the following so landscape design, uh, to be revised and um, subject to a further review by the, uh, excuse me, the overall design uh, to be improved. And then also uh, the structural support uh, should be, excuse me, shall be subject to review and approval by the Architectural Review Committee. And this concludes our staff presentation for 322. Thank you. The matter is now before the commission. Our, uh, if you could take the um, agenda item down, the shared screen down. Thank you. Um, members of the commission, comments, I think generally comments and any questions of staff if there remain, if there are any remaining questions. And just to, as something we, this is something that we need to decide tonight. We um, can't let this go forward. There's no one, no one speaking, Commissioner Lyon. Okay, um, first of all, I admire the patience of the applicant, of staff, of the neighbors who've worked through this. This has uh, been, during my tenure with the commission, it's certainly been the most uh, well thought out, uh, deliberated and considered project that we've taken a look at, both, both of the homes. I've visited the site any number of times to sell my regular walking or bicycling trip as I look at it and, and think about it uh, time and again. The architecture is, is beautiful, although I'm not a good judge of architecture. And what I come back to ultimately is to the general plan. One of the findings that we're required to make is that the project is generally consistent with the uh, general plan. And when I go to the community design element of the general plan, the first, the opening words are, is that the city of Palm Springs is visually defined by both its natural and built environments. Traditionally, the city's built environment has respected and complemented the natural environment. What I see in the community that, that is there now is that the other homes, the existing homes, 
generally work within the landforms that are there. They mine the arroyo uh, and priority is given to the topography and the natural environment with the architecture being respectful uh, and working within the context that it's given. Both of the homes that are now proposed are, and particularly I think the 310 Crestview, they overturn that balance and they defy the land forms, uh, giving pr pr priority to the built environment rather than to the natural environment and land forms. I, I recognize that not that far away, it has been done. Um, there's a home on, I think it's called, uh, on Camino Monte, that is an example of that. And rather than having um, one home or another in a nearby Arroyos set precedent for this particular neighborhood, I, I think it's the examples that I see there are more of a cautionary tale uh, of what can happen if we have homes uh, essentially reshape the landforms. And I am inclined to not support either of the homes because of that. I listened to conversations about, um, and, and the analysis about the hydrology, about flooding, about the size of the homes. I don't think the size of the homes are uh, atypical for that area. I, I think that they are fine. Um, I'm convinced that our engineering, um, after getting through the city's department, would be adequate to provide to prevent flooding uh, of neighboring or these homes themselves. I'm not as concerned about that, but I am concerned when asked to make findings that each of the homes conforms to the intent of the general plan. And in particular, um, I think when we take a look at the finding about the site layout, orientation and location of structures relative to open spaces and topography, and also to the finding for harmonious relationship with the adjoining developments. I am troubled with trying to make those findings. So those are my comments. Commissioner Hirschbein. Uh, I th thank you for that, uh, Commissioner Lamb. Um, my problem stems maybe from the same area, but. Uh, I was asking questions about AMMs and uh, whether they're discretionary or not or by right. And it seems that we do have to make findings to approve an AMM. And one of those is that we have to certify or, or state that this project is harmoni has a harmonious relationship with existing adjoining developments and the community and the neighborhood immediate. And I think there's a, a valid argument, at least in my mind, that can be made that says that, that, that it's not it's not it's not harmonious uh, with with the uh, topography and uh, uh, its its impact to that street. I I, I don't think uh, a ten foot setback on that narrow little street um, uh, is necessarily harmonious. And uh, uh, furthermore, uh, I don't, there's no real clear indication where that street lies in relation to the property line. I mean, I know from my own experience uh, developing properties in the Hollywood Hills, the, the paved street often does not conform to the city right of way. So really, we don't even know where the front property line is. It wasn't, it wasn't plotted out on, in situ there. Um, so to grant the setback when we don't even really know where it is, uh, uh, is, is problematic for me. And uh, the street's very narrow and, an, a, you know, a 10 foot setback might be appropriate in some other uh, contexts, but in this one, it, it doesn't make sense to me. 
Um, so I'm also leaning that for me, it, 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 I can't make that particular finding, which is necessary for the AMM. Commissioner Miller, do you want some comments? Well, I would say, um, obviously, this is the first time that I've been sitting on the commission that I've actually heard these two cases. Um, and I'm familiar with the history because I've looked back at the old staff report and uh, watched uh, some of the video uh, from the past meetings. I'm, I was a little surprised that given the extensive topography of these sites, that there's only three or four steps in each of these homes um, in terms of a step down on the floor plans. Uh, obviously the one house has a, a, a lower level, so I'm sort of excluding that, but from the main floor of the homes, there's only a three steps, which would be about an 18 inch drop in the, in the house. And given that the, properties um, drop a lot more than that, I would say my initial reaction is these volumes um, do not sort of respect the topography. Um, I think they're beautifully designed homes, um, but I would have liked, and I would like to see them sort of step down um, more so than they do, um, as opposed to being cantilevered um, or jutting out into the um, into the um, the gully, uh, the ravine. Um, you know, given that, I will support um, uh, you know a redesign of these homes. I know this has been through that already at least once, so um, I'll defer to the pleasure of the commissioners that have been here as opposed uh, uh, in the you know as to whether you want to continue this again or um, go through a decision-making process that might result in a denial of these uh, homes at this time. So I'll defer to the other commissioners to, to lead that charge. I, I, I want to speak, I know, uh, Commissioner Roberts, do you feel like you need to make comments before I do? Um, Please go ahead. Basically, I don't feel like these homes respect the topography of the land, and I can't make a finding that they're harmonious. Um, the other homes that are on the crest are from, they go from about um, 1,900 square feet 2,178, 2,332, and one is 2,924. I don't know exactly what that pad looked like. I didn't walk up to that par parcel. But I feel like the other homes are smaller and they don't jut out into the ravine. Uh, the jutting out into a 30 foot uh, or more than 30 foot um, slope really bothers me, they jump, they jut out more and they're too big for the pads they're on. Um, a respectful home, I think, I, I also think had one been modern and one been a bit more eclectic, they would respect the fact that the Mesa is very eclectic and the homes on the edge really aren't, uh, aren't all modern architecture. So I, I have a hard time. I can't make the findings on this. Uh, I'm sorry the applicant has gone through this much with it. I think, and I will go to our attorney, I think we do make need to make a decision tonight. And uh, on another note, um, I think that the land, that the landscape plan in on the ridge area needs to be native plants. Um, it can't be plants we take out of um, the, uh, it's, I think it's 
the Coachella Valley Water Resources Board list, which is mainly non-native plants. It should be native back there. And were we to approve this, I probably would have asked for an open space easement, which we can do under our zoning code for, for the land. But I but without a smaller pad, I you know, I think these homes should be reduced. Um, by probably a thousand square, you know, a thousand square feet um, to, to be something that I could be comfortable with that I still would respect the topography of what's on the ridge. I didn't really look at the homes and count the homes that are on the other side of the ridge line, uh, but it's what's surrounding that ridge that's important. And, and I do think that this, these would take um, they, they're out of character with the neighborhood. So, um, Commissioner Roberts, if you have comments. Uh, sure. So, uh, clearly I'm all alone and I can count votes and see where this is going. Um, but I, I have to say I, I really um, part ways with my colleagues on this. Other than thinking these houses are a little big, I think they're very attractive. Um, when we use words like harmony and consistency, those are two words that I never apply to the Mesa in my own head. To me, the absolute beauty of the Mesa, and it's probably my favorite neighborhood in Palm Springs, is that there is no harmony and there is no consistency. There's every type of architecture. There's every scale from huge to tiny, the topography, uh, changes radically from street to street. And that's what makes it beautiful and interesting. I think that adding two modern homes that are distinctly different and interesting in their own ways adds to that beauty. With respect to them cantilevering over their own land, but not into the gully, I don't see that as a problem. There are plenty of homes, including the one next door, that have decks and balconies and all sorts of things that cantilever. It's part of the nature of hillside properties. And so I think that um, other than them being a little bit large and not that, I don't think they're that oversized. I think these houses are attractive and I think they do fit in. You know, I, I read the neighbor comments and public comments very carefully, and they very much have an impact on my deliberations and, and how I think about these projects. And many of the neighbor's concerns were about the houses in the future, the other houses that this develop, or other parcels that this developer has in, in this area. And for me, those properties would be scrutinized in a big way. Um, because they, they are down in the actual gully area. But I think these two houses are attractive and I think they do fit in and I think they're interesting and they're unusual and they add to the fabric that is the Mesa um, for whatever that's worth, thanks. Uh, our attorney has had his hand up for quite some time, Mr. Leishman. I don't believe I, I don't see my hand up, I'm sorry. If there was a mechanical hand up. I haven't seen it up. I apologize for that. Ah. Um, Madam Chair, I could just uh, note that uh, there were some comments um, from commissioners about the front yard setback. In the event that the project did comply with the 25 feet, it should be known that that would push the house further back and potentially down into where um, there has been some previous comments about the flood issues um, relative to the project. So just something to keep in mind. Um, one other comment is relative to the street. The Mesa streets, um, given the historic locations that they are, are certainly off center. Um, so there is an exhibit in your packet T0.01 that does show that the street is further offset from uh, the property line. Uh, and also on that same page, you do see some of the other locations of the homes in the neighborhood and their setbacks relative to the streets. So there is some historic precedent for 
homes that are closer to the street to address either topography issues um, or perhaps um, natural drainage channels through the, the neighborhood. So I just want to make those comments um, uh, relative to those questions or um, issues that were brought up. Thank you. Uh, just in terms of my comments, mine did not go to the 10 foot setback. I think it probably was necessary uh, for any house that would be built on the site. Madam Chair, may I make one comment before you move further with this? No, you may not. I see. This matter is before the commission. But this is the old set of rules that we are under. This is a design issue that you're having a problem with. This was discussed a year ago in ARC and it was approved by ARC and now you're faulting it on design. Had you visited this issue back then or had someone disagreed with it back then, I wouldn't have had three revisions to these. I would have saved over $100,000 in a year of time. These are real damages because of the inadequacy of this whole process. I was told I was under a different set of rules than currently exist. Why are we talking about design issues? We've moved on. It's all about compliance now. This, uh, you're out of order, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, at this point, I believe we have to take action on this, don't we? We can't, this is not a redesign question. This is an up or down question, David. That's correct. Unless um, the applicant wants to continue it further, I'm, I'm assuming he does not to modify the design. Um, but ultimately, yes. If that would be a question for the applicant because we are under. Uh, I think we we have timelines to make decisions. Madam Chair and Commission, those timelines are really to benefit the applicant. They're the they're the applicants to waive. If the applicant doesn't want the benefit of a short turnaround or a deadline for making a decision, they don't have to take it. They can request additional continuances or additional hearings. And it then becomes your decision whether to grant that request or not. So in that respect, I would hear from the applicant. Can I... Um... Uh, it's hard for me to say because the the contradictions between you and the ARC is very difficult to predict. Um, as you know, our intention with cantilevering over the hillside was to comply with the building code, which says we can't grade within a slope that's 30%. The solution there was to float it above the 30% slope, use piles. It was only you know, discussion with ARC that forced 322 further down, 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 down that allowed us to grade in a portion of that slope. 310 didn't get that benefit. So to penalize us based on something that was recommended by the ARC seems, uh, you know, it's frustrating to say the least. And to say we've been designing these around what we thought was respect to the hillside that's written in your code to avoid slope that's uh, steeper than a certain uh, percentage. That's what we tried to do. We tried to do that. And now we're getting penalized for it, saying that it's not harmonious. So it's hard to say what, what you know, whether we want to continue this or not, or just go straight to appeal if this is denial. I think I'm going to leave that to you. Do you want? Are there any conditions that, that we can, we know about now that we can hear? I think the matter is before the commission then. Thank you. We'll, we'll just continue to discuss it. For me, the houses are too large and they should be up the pad. Uh, they should respect the hillside in the same way that the houses, the other houses that are on the ridge do. You can't leave her about 40 feet it looks like 20 to 40 feet beyond the adjacent house. 
where do you, can you point to the drawing that shows that? You can, you can look, I'm, you know. I designed them, I designed them, I know. I'm sorry, I'm not in a discussion with you. This is before the commission. Madam Chair and Commission, if I may, without an unambiguous uh, request for a continuance, it might be better for the applicant and the city to just reach a decision tonight from which the applicant might take its appeal if, if it so chooses. Thank you. That's, that is how I'm going to proceed. I'm gonna make a motion, a separate motion on each of the houses for denial. Is there a second? Do we need to make, uh, typically I would think that we would have a resolution of denial prepared by staff that lays out the, the basis for this. Is this, uh, do we not need that? Do we just vote to deny? We should if have we, a resolution. If we continue, can we meet with you to discuss potential design? So we don't have to, to prolong this so that we can decide what needs to be made um, before the next planning commission hearing. To, t to try to interpret what you guys find harmonious, different from what ARC found harmonious, is very difficult to do. In, We're willing to continue if we can work with you to come up with a solution. ARC, in the process you went through, was an advisory body to the planning commission who had the decisions. So it, it has happened in the past. We've changed the procedure on this but that's the process you went through. So ARC's decisions on this were never final. They were always subject to the planning commission looking at it against these conditions to see if we could approve. And um, it's part of the reason we did make the changes. All I'm, re all I'm requesting is if we continue, is there a way to work with you to make resolutions that appease the body, the planning commission body? Before we before we spend uh, hours and hours and thousands of dollars in changes that may or may not be may, not, may or may not appeal to you, Madam Chair and Commission, I might be able to help with that. Uh, just as a reminder for the applicant, of course, the um, you, there's no opportunity to meet with the body as a whole without it being a noticed meeting um, and a public meeting like this one, but. Any applicant can always seek out its public officials in one or in one on one meetings or one on even two meetings, as long as there's not a majority of the body there. Um, you can, and, but that it, it's up to the officials whether to meet with you or not. Um, but from a legal perspective, you can, you can seek input um, in ones and twos. I'm sure. We, what we might propose is a subcommittee of the commission, if the commission is so willing um, to review a schematic revision to the plan. And if that is something the commission is willing to consider, that is something that you might do tonight. If not, um, our recommendation is to proceed with an action. I think we'd like to proceed with an action as well. I, I would recommend that commission deny if that's the vote and let the applicant appeal to council. I think then we need a resolution of denial. Staff can prepare a resolution of denial based on the findings um, you present or what you would like us to include. Um, we've presented some for you as um, findings and support. However, if the commission has made findings based on your discussion tonight, um, in the draft resolution, we can modify those or those findings, each one um, that the commission would like us to change. And we will make that the final resolution if it is a denial. Does one of my commissioners want to um, make proposals, Commissioner Lyon? Uh, 
I, in particular, found that I was not comfortable making uh, with the resolution that staff had prepared for approval uh, with making the findings number one and number two. I believe that the site layout, uh, orientation, location of the structures, and the relationship to one another and to the open space and topography uh, is not consistent with the objectives of the general plan community design element. I also think that the uh, I could not make the finding that either of the homes was harmonious uh, in relationship with existing and proposed adjoining developments. In particular, the homes were, uh, the proposed homes project too far into the Arroyo, which is inconsistent with what the rest of the homes along that Arroyo are doing. I acknowledge that, yes, there are gaps and that there are uh, elements, but these, uh, the mass of the homes themselves were cantilevered out and proposed, uh, uh, imposed into the landforms there in a way that was not consistent with the general plan. I have notes here sometimes. With the general plan uh, dictum that the city of Palm Springs traditionally, um, the city's built environment has respected and complemented the natural environment. So those were my greatest we, concerns. We only project 12 feet beyond the neighbor's cantilever. Excuse me. Mr. Newell, I don't mean to be rude, but I think we may need to mute our guests so that we can have this discussion. If, if that's a motion, I'll second it to Commissioner O'Leary. The only other thing that I would add is I can't, I think the overall mass of the homes is too great. So that is number three. And uh, in terms of the lands, the location of plantings for desert conditions, the plantings on the Arroyo need to be native plantings and can't be plantings that come out of lush and be lush and efficient book. Um, the, the, the plantings on the Arroyo definitely have to have to be native plants. As far as the landscape requirement, I totally agree with you, but this is going to go before council and I'd like to get our most um, salient points, the ones that are leading us not to approve in front of them so that they focus on those. On plants. So I'll keep it to number three, which is the mass. Right. Uh, Madam Chair and Commission, before you vote on that motion or, or refine it, um, I, for, for the sake of the record, I'd like to clarify, I'm looking in the code at the findings that need to be made for approving or not a minor modification. The first one is uh, that the requested minor, minor modification is consistent with the general plan. I think that we just heard an articulation of a finding of how that cannot be made um, and the overall objectives of the zoning ordinance. But there are, there are three other findings there, and I would I would prefer for the record to reflect a determination one way or the other on B, C, and B. And I'm looking at, uh, oh gosh, maybe David can help me. This is 94.06.01. Um, B, three, little B, C, and D. Uh, I, I was listening to you carefully and I didn't hear anybody speak directly to whether or not the neighboring properties will be adversely affected as a result of granting the minor mod. Um, I'd like to hear about that on the record. Also, I, I would like to hear about whether an approval or conditional approval would be detrimental to the health, safety, or general welfare of persons living there or nearby. 
And lastly, I'd like to get something on the record about whether or not you find that the approving the minor mod would um, is justified or not justified by the environmental features. And maybe you have spoken to that uh, environmental features, site conditions, and location of existing improvements. I guess that would include existing homes and the historical development patterns. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lishman, do we really have to make findings on, I thought uh, we've been advised previously that all it takes is one finding that we can't make and that is sufficient. If, does, we, want, if we don't have a, uh, an opinion in concert about um, the other ones, do we really need to make a finding? No, it just makes it easier on the appeal and it makes it easier to defend the decision if you've been a little more exhausted. But certainly as a as a legal threshold, you have to make all four to approve. And if you okay. find that you cannot make one of them, then that is legally sufficient. But um, just to eliminate downstream uh, contention, if you can make those other findings, great, please do. If you can't, you're not comfortable, you don't have a consensus, that's fine as well. Uh, let me, I'm just looking at the findings on page three and four of eight, and I'm looking at, um, just only looking at one of them, which is, I, um, yes. so I don't know which page you're referring to, because I can't find those. That's on page six and seven of the resolution relative to the minor modification that would be recital L in the, red, in the draft result? Well, let's just go through. So we've gone through the, the findings for approval of the project, correct? And we've said we can't make finding one, finding two, or finding three. I, I think that's plenty. I think that's, that's all plenty. we need to say. Um, do is anybody concerned about building design materials or colors? No. So, and then on the minor modification, um, and that starts on page six of the resolution. And the minor modification is the increase in building height and the, and the 10 foot setback versus the 25 foot setback. Correct. Um, does anybody, is anybody objecting to, the, to either of the uh, AMAs? I, I kind of don't know what the building would look like without the, the height issue, so. Um, mine are really to the, the general approval. I don't have any on the AMA, on the administrative minor approvals. Uh, Mr. Miller, do you? Well, I would just say for my from my perspective, I'm looking at page eight of 14 of the staff report under criterion findings 94.04.00e. <clears throat> Site number one is site layout, orientation, location of structures and relationship to one another and to open spaces and topography. My big issue, I think, is with the relationship to the topography. I don't have a problem with the 10 foot front setback. I think, as was stated by someone else, if you push the, the, the project back, it goes further into the ravine, which is not good. I don't have a problem with the square footage of the homes, uh, as uh, Vice Chair Robert said, there's a huge variation of sizes of homes in the Mesa, and I'm fine with having homes of 3,200 square feet, including the garage, um, smaller square footage for the actual building um, or the actual floor plan of the home. My big issue is with topography. And I just don't feel like the structures, the, the volumes of the structures have respected the topography enough. It may just mean, from my perspective, 
pushing down that most northern, the northernmost volume of the building down a couple more feet in elevation. Um, whether that means there's some grading that has to be done or not, I don't know. There's a the cantilever uh, in the sections. The cantilever shows like there's room for that volume to be sunk in further, and that would satisfy me. So my concerns may be a little bit less um, sort of onerous than what some of the other commissioners have stated, but that would be the finding that I would attack a denial on um, or base a denial on. Um, and I would stay away from the general plan because that's that language is general for a reason. Um, and the general plan um, objectives and, uh, and uh, you know, shall be, should be sort of turned into uh, zoning code provisions. And so I think if we can um, base our, base a denial, if that's what's gonna happen here on the zoning code findings, I think we're in a better position. And like has been stated, I think we only have to attack it on one. And for me, that is the topography uh, issue. Can we reflect that we have different points of view on this? Because for me, the size of the home is, is inconsistent with- Well, the well Scott, yeah. I think if you go to three, it says uh, overall mass, which I think is something you're discussing if you're trying to suppress the height of the building. So at least you could make the finding one and three right. or, or not make the finding one and three, yeah. sorry. Um, and you may have a problem with two, I think, right? Well, I don't know. Two is, seems to be speaking more to is the is the house um, okay with the context? And I I think it's okay with the ton context if you can solve the variation in the topography and the, the massing issue. Um, well, right right now, we're just talking about what we have, not what we could have. So um, if you don't agree that two applies to what we have, then maybe we limit the findings that we couldn't make the findings for one and three, if that'll get you there. And we, we have three people who can't, I think, can't make the findings for one, two, and three. And you want to vote? Can't make them. Yeah. Okay. Let's vote. So those of us, can we just take a voice vote who can't make the findings for one? <laughs> My head is spinning. Okay. Are we on the the minor modification findings? Or are we which number one? Where? Architectural review. I'm sorry, David. What? The architectural review findings. So site layout, orientation, location, which is the first one. So we have four who can't make that. Uh, for harmonious relationship with the existing and proposed development in the immediate neighborhood. Um, I, I, who can't I can't make, make that. Two. I can't make that. I can't make that. Michael can't make that. And you can. So we should just reflect that. And for, so we have, a, a, and then for three, the overall mass. And that's, is that four of us? Uh, I would say, yeah. So, and so those are the ones we can't make. And I, I can't find the, the findings for the, administrative minor approval. Okay, it's consistent with the general plan, applicable specific plans. Does anybody have, is anybody wanting to make findings on the, on the uh, minor modifications? What pages, what page is, are those ones on? Those are, they start on page six. Number L. My findings are on page 11. I'm, I'm on uh, 3A right now. The findings are on page 11, I believe, aren't they? 
Oh, I'm on page, I'm on 310. So, when so um, I think Commissioner O'Malley, you're looking at the staff report from December 8th. Okay, that may be the case. So if you look further uh, forward in the packet, uh, in okay. the draft resolution. Um, okay, yep, I see that. I, I just don't, I can't make the I the am the minor ones aren't the ones I, I'm making the denial based on is my so well I mean if if you look at one and two it kind of mirrors what we just noted is not being able to find so if you want to include L one and two on what we're not able to find I'd be okay with that. So L1 and 2. Yeah. I, can somebody define for me what the overall objectives of the zoning ordinance are? That's a good question. Yes. Okay. Said yes, and can you? Is that our attorney? It was uh, me, Madam Chair. Oh. So one and two, um, L1 and two, we will, is there a four person vote on that? I, I uh, number one, I'm not comfortable with unless, I'm not comfortable with uh, making findings on it unless somebody tells me what the overall objectives of the zoning ordinance are, then it could be more particular. And number two, the neighboring properties will not be adversely affected. We, we've had nothing, we've had nothing but um, a parade of residents who don't want this, who complain it to, about it, who object to it for myriad reasons they would certainly argue that their property would be adversely affected, but I don't know. Are we saying that their property values would be negative, adversely affected? Are we saying that uh, the hydrology issues might not be solved and therefore their properties, if, if they're arguing that it's their view that's um, adversely affected, I would argue that there's no, nobody has a right to their view. Uh, so I, I'm not comfortable with saying that num item number two can't, can't clearly be found. So you want to leave off L1 and L2? I would leave off L2 and L1, I like I say, I would still need to know what, what the yeah. uh, general Just for, of, of just for context, was. I would say that probably the hardest finding to make of the four is the last finding relative to... And that's the one I thought that I probably couldn't make. Number four? Correct. The approval of the minor modification is justified by environmental features site conditions, location of existing improvements, and historical development patterns of the property and neighborhood. I agree that I would have a very difficult time making that finding. Due to topography issues. I yes, yes. I, I agree with, with uh, Commissioner Miller's concerns and comments about the topography and that being really, uh, the massing on the topography as being really key to um, this not working with the intent of the general plan, in my opinion. So we've said one in four. Madam Chair, one and four are the findings here that you cannot make. That we cannot make. Correct. Right. Thank you.
So we have a, mo do I have a motion and a second? I will make the motion if no one else wants to. I'll make the second. Fine. So we were in the findings. We couldn't make one, two, and three of the architectural findings and one in four of the... Um, minor modification. Minor modification. So it's a, it's a denial on both projects. We need to vote on them separately. Correct. Can you call the roll? Okay, here we go. So um, we're voting separately. I have a first, who's a second on this? Commissioner Hirschbein. Chair Wormit. I did say yes. Commissioner Hirschbein. Yes. Commissioner Alea? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. And Vice Chair Roberts? No. Denial is approved. Are you going to call the property separately? That was for which property? It was 3A. Are we keeping the same motion? Yes. Okay, so it's the same motion, same sec first and second. Correct. Chair Wormit? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner Leon? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Vice Chair Roberts? No. Denial is approved. Uh, it's four to one. There is no new business. We are now at Planning Commission reports, requests, and comments. Uh, there being none, is there a um, Planning Director's report? Um, Madam Chair and Commissioners, uh, as you know, likely um, the City Council is currently doing their visioning sessions, so um, stay tuned for that um, as there will be, um, you know, some of the priorities that they've identified that apply to us are relative to the general plan, um, the housing element, the city's uh, infrastructure, sustainability um, goals, and, and so forth. So. Um, we have gotten some direction on that, but um, uh, more on that will be com will come forward as we get into the budgeting process for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, and that's all I have to report, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, the meet we are adjourned on Planning Commission is adjourned until five thirty Wednesday, March 9th, twenty twenty two.